Ali, with the doll. Uh, if I can ask anybody to please uh, make their way inside and uh, get a seat, we will begin our uh, summit shortly. Thank you.
Alex, 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 Alex. Itu tahu, itu tahu ladies and gentlemen. Kuli itu terkial, terkengar rapai. Anglong, lor terkangal metmu, muda program lagi. Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. I'm asking everybody that's still at the uh, registration area to please make their way in. We're about to start our program. Thank you. There's still plenty of chairs on this left, uh, to my left. Can we ask uh, Dr. Myra Fraser Adelbai to come up to the podium if she's here? Once again, ladies and gentlemen, Ali Ungil Tutau, welcome to day one of the summit. Uh, before we uh, continue, we proceed, uh, let's just go over a couple of uh, housekeeping items. So we ask everybody to please either put your phones, cell phones on silent or turn them off. Um, the restrooms are to the left side of the registration area. Uh, there are restrooms for both male and female. Um, we are going to begin with the opening prayer. So Pastor Balgu Sandario has worked with the 
a faith-based community in Palau for over 30 years um, with the Palau Evangelical Church. In 2014, he was ordained as the pastor and travels within and outside of Palau. He is also the chairman of the Palau National Parole Board, chairman for the PECS Ordination Committee, member of the uh, Mouse Petania High School Board, a member of the Belau Cancer Society, as well as the Belau Behavioral Health Advisory uh, Council. Pastor uh, Palgo Sangario. Malam <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Our opening chant will be given to us by uh, Mr. O'Keefe. O'Keefe Arkokichi is a youth from the Tnurong Hamlet of Koror, uh, who is currently a PCC student. He is on the board of trustees and the student trustee, and, and is also a student trustee. He is a member of the Bangigoy Society. He, uh, he has also been studying under Ratur J. Watanabe, and in recent years has been forming chants for special occasions. Mr. Ogif. Makmaung O the swakla O the swakli lang Isale ma bedem se gade di gwit raungi takoi de di di da di takung ma bedu da di imong Raungil galulau, madora legdam albiang. Ema bedem se gade, wadangaratul ngodulal, magdiga ngor kawitarat ko. Eraudi ay se ang idaraudi oriyang hmm. Ay masula. Thank you, Oki, for that. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to give us his opening and welcoming remarks, it is a great honor to introduce our Minister of Health and Human Services. Uh, Kafar J. Erbalau became the Minister of Health of Palau in December 2021. He has a long history within the Palau Ministry of Health and Human Services, serving as an administrator, COVID-19 EOC Deputy Incident Commander, Public Information Officer, and PHSS Grant Coordinator. He has also served as a board member on the Palau National Scholarship Board 
as well as chairman of the Palau Red Cross Society's Central Branch Board in 2019. Mr. Ervalau was selected as, as part of the inaugural cohort of Ocean, Ocean Yap Foundation leaders, Asia Pacific, a cross setting of 200 emerging civic leaders from 33 nations and ter territories in the region. The year-long leadership program is designed to further inspire, empower, and connect emerging leaders to change the world. He is the first Palauan chosen to join the Obama Foundation Leadership Program. Mr. Ebelau has a Bachelor of Arts in Social Science for Public Health and Politics and International Relations from the University of Auckland. He served in the U.S. Army in the position of Paralegal Specialist 2070. Minister Ebelau. I wasn't uh, nervous, but then that introduction made me even more nervous. Thank you everyone for joining us for this, I guess, inaugural uh, Palau Health Summit. I will be speaking mostly in Palawan, but uh, there will be a copy of my remarks in English made available uh, at the end of the summit this week. So the law mool Susar Mataklet who can't the all other Sasus and Mora Kol Libdul Mara Klai Maroi Lubul Bela who miss a baby gum matyang um sulam lay Pilum may be the clay um sulam lay marogul masil bela His Excellency President Whips Martel Direct Ma Madam Vice President uh, Sangabaw Senior, Marugui Cabinet min, uh, Members and Artyang. Uh, Senate President uh, Baules, Marugui Senators and Artyang. Toguni uh, Senator Quartel, ya Chairman of uh, Health and Social Welf Welfare Committee of Senate, Kumsu Lang Artyang, eh, Senator Quartel. Speaker of House, sab uh, Sabino Anastasio, Marugui Delegates, Director of the Delegates and Artyang, Lal Tutau. Honorable uh, Chief Justice uh, Ngirai Galang, Marugul Justices, Marugul State Governors, uh, Legislators, uh, Mr. Bebira Governors, uh, uh, State uh, Legislators at Tangartiang. We also welcome and acknowledge the presence of uh, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Your Excellencies, Ambassadors uh, Ori Kasa, Ambassador Lee, and Ambassador Turner. Thank you for being with us today. And thank you for your continued uh, partnership and support of the health of Hello. We recognize our sponsors, MD Wholesale, Tira sponsor in part the Tial Health Summit. Our donors, Maria Met Farm, Ministry of Justice, Ministry of Education, Super Ministry, Minister Tmutul, National Emergency Management Office, PNOC. Director Merenga Sule la TMC, my role in productions, la live uh, live stream, my gal audio visual la seals. Director Sade Merenga Sule la US Department of Health and Service, uh, Human Services, la funding support at the summit the year la seals. Mga niya harsa, ma samsa, ma US CDC. Director Sade Merenga Sule la TMC, my role in productions, la live uh, live stream, my gal audio visual la seals. Director Sade Merenga Sule la US Department of Health and Services, la funding support at the both uh, in person and virtual. Magulingit naman bear with me ang malbatokal ngak, landi kong das yung malungila abok uyo. Dahil siya mga ringi abok kulbes ringi, hindi mo subes, hindi ko malmisulang. So, I'd like to acknowledge and thank all of our presenters and speakers for this week, including those who uh, presented and spoke at the Youth Forum, Youth Health Forum yesterday, and the several uh, pre-summit events. So, His Excellency President Whips, Honorable Vice President Senior, Honorable Senator uh, Quarte, First Lady uh, Valerie Whips, Judy Otto, all the presenters from the Ministry of Health and Human Services, Bank of Hawaii, 
OJ Cuts, NEMO, PCC, Palau High School, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Finance, Palau Red Cross Society, PCAA, Ministry of State, Palau Motake School, IOM, Ministry of Justice, Ministry of Public Infrastructure and Industries, Palau National Scholarship Board, Palau Area Health Education Center, or AHEC, UNICEF, USCDC, Pangigoy Society, Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, ASTO, LAIB, Association of Palau, the Filipino Community in Palau, Palau Parents Empowered, Pacific Islands Health Officers Association, or PIHOA, California Department of Health, University of Hawaii, Yulado, Loma Linda University, Belau Foreign Spouses Society, National Environmental Health Association, Ms. Ayana Ringil, Care Council of the Pacific Islands, Bravo Behavioral Health Services, Palau National Olympic Committee, the Secretariat of the Pacific Community, SPC, Pacific Islands Primary Care Association, Roanoke College, Omrasang Association, Tripler Army Medical Center, Father Francis Hazel, Houston Astro, Blay Madris, and last but not least, the World Health Organization presenters, especially Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, who will be delivering uh, remarks today. I mention all of these because I think that embodies the concept of equity and represents all of the support that we get at the ministry and the health sector for the health of Palau. I'd like to give them a, ask for a round of applause for all our presenters. Thank you. <laughs> Last but not least, I want to thank all of you who are here today. There's the students, there's uh, the not-so-youth, there are members of the health sector from both the public uh, service, from the hospital, from the private sector, from the civil society. And last but not least, I'd like to ask the, the newest of the health workforce to stand up. All of the members of the Community Health Workers Program in blue, please stand up so we can recognize you. <laughs> These are the newest faces of health in Palau. Thank you. So I, I was uh, writing my remarks. I started two weeks ago, but I didn't finish until this morning at about 5 a.m. And I finally opened the slides that uh, Director Scher, Director of Public Health, sent to me, and I thought it was only two slides. It was 20. Including myself, Last the Loru, a claw, Londibra, El Silvelau, El Gere La Tora held them le Emerra and Namemo, two thousand eighteen. So it's been half a decade since we've had a, a convening at the national level for health. Ongerung, a Yagidil Londibel Dungut Mok, Ram Lamemong, a public health convention. Omasin Dragel Tapix, Miguel Aldo, Adimsa, the Tora, Rear Public Health. Inclusive Hospital, Ong edei segi del timer git, 
improving health through the lens of health equity. Again, in the case of the last one, the final say, in the case of the parents assume that they are terung to the day, and they are going to get the same thing. 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 Se equality. Di kita mungkin elu aser ar ada ka kita ada ka kerus. Barang lagi ada ka kerus. Ka kerus asorir, ka kerus tirir, ka kerus adu ertir, mangal sengsir. Iga kita kelak ka kerus, iga kita dalam belas sebelum bes lu aser. Maka ada adres iga kita kelak ka kerus ertir, mesti buil. Lebesa iga kita tabasul lulu mula terjadi. Agam dah selesai kita saya dah mula seng equity. Tiada kalau sebab itu lama saya langgar asku, tiada langgar maris tiada langgar tiang. Tengah hari imol dau, tengah hari imol grave. Ngosisi warakir, ngosisi wa aigel mukter kerja terjadi, ngosisi wa standard sama aigel tengal suara bol la achieve. Ding tak ada kerja kerusi belu. Ganyar bermelukut tukar abang barat, bermelukut tim melukut tukar belau. Mangga kerus sesuai gitu. Gitu muka kerus sa. Ati telat atau muka kerut tim melukut dulu sah kerti. Masa bil rich sesuai gitu. Imol durung ulat. Last example lah masing masing ramal di luar kawasan modulitian. Adi wah dalam dalam el sel do do lalum. Sebab el dosisul El tanel dengar imol dalam el modal, el diosisi yang mukti kerjai el suara bolungin at pel. Di el suku mengkakarau sa aklungel asil sel mora yang tebelol dalam lalu bengani imol mengisong saral makoya sel murni, yang mau kakarau sa at pel. Same direct kelas el dalam mesin ini loseng equity. Maka memang tu boleh kalau lihat slides. Selalu mesra tukar equity, health equity berlalu ilat time. Ega ngah tulung tuk logi wangi surti lagi dalam asto masih di sini. Sehingga kerau sa akses ra kerau selat almara services ral sel health services ral sel abul berlalu. Diri ngarngi ya a mistrust ma misinformation. Ralat saya labur bela ratu korahil. Di luar kengarngi ya awal digel. Marat toko ni mungkin ada lat. Di tin melmal dapat tinggi maklang ada tin. Di luar kau close health stigma meliwek ra behavioral ma mental health. Kau dapat tinggi luar seng. Tambah labu toko ada orang model blue kelu mungkin ada belau. Membelau oil di kengarngi segi di language barrier. Eh, kalau tadi mendengar rokui luas ya NCD ya maldi ruka klon, lom kotal rablu belau, eh klon lom seher ada rablu. Eh kalau nombor yang kalau terak, kalau dalam loh soi sebab pandemik, kalau tadi dengar alat selap pandemik, mengmal lom ketuk lagi lagi dal inequity. Eh kalau ul mar ada, kagaru sel ada dia kalau sebiji dal nguangil service, din direct ke teal. Dos dos meses dos días que llegué del claro claro es el el issues claro claro es el issues y hemos hablado sobre el adres next slide se lo mes la population hablo de la hija nombre el Luis Ra se el graph el ngara que todo 2000 census 20 2000 en el ngara right a 2020 ganía Almost eight percent the decline in our population over the last two decades. So your role, our other, we look at what's over below. Next slide. 
vital statistics at yung gagagadala at ang media lo plus may malaring information makalumot tabi niya lalwi eh kung nakmuy kang araw ay tayo mula mara kada kada 2022 yung katangil mo kloa kotal ra roll ra silbi na yung osisil time yung katangil mo rio ra roll ra erul dart ra silat tara yung lo 155 Ya ketengil yang lak la kotal la Ra erul dark terat selat tarra Next slide Aige el ngi a kotal Lom kotal la sel belaw Last year mle infectious disease Heart disease Kasinoma Telemal morabatengit Mal liver disease Next slide. So the mess are medical referrals. I get top five for 2019 and more last year. I'm like a sinoma, heart disease, neurology, orthopedics, and my urology. The mle clora erul tela el ada the referred tira last year. Ya ara la ukurur tira rogu ya mle. 20 million, 20.3. Next slide. So, the mess of the NCD risk factors are maklul at. Yang malyo sisi. Yang atalgi bil outdated al 2016 al hybrid. Yagi dapat matmok ra a survey al alir sa yagi dal hybrid dalo bang gila community health assessment mo sa bae dal compare sa yagi dal gagi dal ooy. Di sa lomes, hindi nga ka mag-change. Next slide. Children and adolescent health. Again. Hindi ka chance. At suko mag-change, ay maran mo mag-git. Ika nga based sa school health screening data sa last 2021. Mal-alarming rin nga sa higitin. Etiul ba sa entrar nga lang? 5 to 19 years old. Okay. Am lata lom dasual, itin malmal lah betengin malumuk langar ti. Next slide. Ela kadem lah betengin asyik kadem arget. Makera wase, soal dal meral betul get, eh makarang atau meral murni. Where are we going? What's the ideal state of health equity in Palau? Ay ka ako ra mo walom to kay get tilong ra walel sin ay get kung existing barriers sa mga issue ra health equity. Di mral sa wala dal malas sa mga imol sector. Di ka dil hospital, madi ka dil ministry. Mutmak kita mral adra bulu. Iman malas sa mga lomes sin magkarat ka ing isyo ng malisya walet. Malbol tapos sula at teli ra rock will at kaya bela ng malangis sul get los pera to ko ra hel. Next slide. Ika ikit ay gil patosat ang al-sil sa paklugo kong mangyaw sa al malas sa malakay ng isa yung loo mes ilwa sa ngaray ka ikit ay kakaraw sa teal ma teletay raw riyol sa pwede lo giw. Ika ikit ay maral mo sa pwede lo ngil server at rabulu. Next slide. Maldi mati ilat tablo. Senator Quarte ang mamsat at tiyang Direct kalau masuk ira health equity, gaya gel dalam kodong lah se social determinants of health. Gaya gel telang tengi lah back kalau sil serak langar makla ader git. Langar ni al dalih malu ubung ngoto i rah health ader git. Ikom noris sel lokal ngar mada tiang. Angan i gaya git dalam gaya kerel siasing lo otil lah se health langar school, health langar hospital matok orang guru. Ahel dengar Maori Rabli, ma Aigel Basol de Kiringi. Ahel dengar Shugang, dengar Klauat, dengar Teluil, dengar Dongli, dengar At, dengar Telungal, dengar Kabli. Ahel dengar Economics, melubung Kaisa Rabluat. Next and last slide. 
سوق الغرا دي مو تلقيب لو اي سيقل قرا اما ظل او ريليد المرال بدو لو اي يقل مرال ميل تل الراق ما يقل براري تيرا منستري غدا ملاسم الوي الاين را اورغنيزيشن رقيت مو تلقيب الستريم لاين مو بيو تلقيب الورور ترا التقرا هيلد غدا مو ملاسم الامبروف ستاندارتز اقواليتي ما تتلى لو ريور را تقرأ وقرول ما يجيل public health and human services قد ما ملاسم ال لو لقيه ذرا هيل ذا المرأة ذرا بلو ارتجل ما لو سبيرني قد ما ديسنترال ملاسم ال decentralized يجي جيد ال public health ما community human services preventive ما primary care ده ديرك ال ملاستر تلوم داس ورا بس ال hospital دينين ستيان عمل مقتطل Dom dasar ini, dom sahaja ini, mengani plan bela domu ulmat mukar ini, yang kita minister obi yang Marcel Malmundo Abdul, lengge ya chairman ada, akan miter kita tegi di luriot. Direct kan ini sela, eleven dah sixteen el, big tapi ini sel BNH authority, maka direct kan ada transition el mesti segi di hotel lah hospital, amor eungel segi di board. Sel mo mga ngayon mga priority ay para adra held. Bum kita nung sel gumdas sa segal na umbre galraging teterung tetedel adra held ang lamos mail al di luryo de mos mail ma. E malbuto ka retire del al adra held al direct al di mo retire di mo nagal al kamang tatay met metermil di mo. Maral gire del makarogu e mes la se makarado lisi ira a health workforce. Al dia kadi tago era capacity building, malubog kada training, direct al gira mal mungil gergik ra health, ra kumamil dito. Ikal tablol madalaw dito, ikal objectives ang ani sa gid il health system strengthening. Magdado lisi era tago ra dito, magdado si kore la bes el el masil, ma bes el tatemono. Makarat improve standards. Engelong erong a segi dil bodong at mokrengil national health improvement framework. Al modo daira wele dil lo mesilo a se katigire el gera toko ra held. Gire el gera tisi ila wele. Akman di mreng a suli lo se bilmer el alsil se. E olingit dil lo a se to lo mol mat makar el alsil se. Maklugu kumung yao se. And we'll talk about topics. There's over 80 topics uh, over the next two and a half, day, three days. Uh, so please uh, continue to come back. There's free coffee and uh, lunch. Uh, and uh, we hope to see you uh, the next couple of days. So, Roman we thank you. Roman Sulang, Minister Rebella, for his. Uh, uh, words. Uh, okay, to give us uh, his special remarks is His Excellency uh, Surang S. Whips Jr. President Whips Jr was uh, sworn in as President of the Republic of Palau in January 2021, becoming the country's 10th elected head of state. Through sound policies, diplomacy, partnerships, and the hard work of the U Ministry of Health and Human Services, Palau successfully limited the impact of COVID-19 in Palau. And though challenges continues, the President and the administration are persistent in having a health infrastru infrastructure that serves the needs of the, Palauan, of the Palauan people. Modernizing medical services and access is the foundation of, the, of President Witt's public health agenda. A commission has been established to explore the financing and relocation of the country's lone public hospital from the current dilapidating state and sea rising, uh, rising sea prone site. 
Under his presidency, public health policies focus on preventive care, moving away from the reactive pra practices that have resulted in an expensive medical referral program and other cost-saving measures. Prior to the presidency, he served as a senator of the Olbi Ragalulao from 2009 to 2016. His Senate report cards reflects the reputable record in policymaking to promote and protect the best interests of Palawans, including spearheading legislation that increased the minimum wage in 2013, the first such increase since 1997. President Whips has a bachelor's degree in business administration in economics from Andrews University and a master's of business administration from the University of California, Los Angeles. President Whips is married to Valerie Esang Ramangsao Whips and they have four children. His Excellency, Mr. President Whips, Jr. Testing. 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 Delegate Kanai, a very good morning to uh, the members of the diplomatic corps that are joining us today. Ambassador Turner, Ambassador Lee, Ambassador Oikasa, and uh, Sergei Bauner. We are Delighted to have you joining us this morning. You know, uh, I'm happy to be here this morning because the First Lady makes sure that I'm healthy. You know, I walked in this morning and uh, some gentleman at the back asked me, you look uh, much taller. And I said, uh, no, I, I actually am now the weight I was when I was in college. So, uh, I'm thankful for that and thankful for the support because it takes family uh, to be in good health. Akora dekzamnya sa kung ilong dul to kora brigel to kora belaw. Di bilong kora first el health summit tra belur belaw ngagira dermo dul to kora belaw. Ebere rada sil mo sumukan bitar at brigel dalan de to kaya mo liyud mo tira vice president tada. Di Kita meral sembari yang artinya yang mereka sulit lah Minister Ahe, Minister Ahe, dan Minister Gafar ma rogol adal. Ligera amat maklul tiadon di berlalu tu tau. Sembari ya tele dal mel kadom meser betul uriul. Kadom meser wasi ngara albal ngalai dal elang wasi kadom meral betul ker. Tiada saya dal duli. Tiada lom mereka raga kumral wasi Nah, saya kata sila sebab sila kotel meringal time, ragovid. Aktuali seleng, akmeneng lu asa rada terengar hospital amlo, ultar sila kotel obrado de meringal time. Di kata blol di elbang alai gel niya asa ngal sengal sila hospital, ya dia kata uktu esa gel niya amle meringal urio gel mokl ulu kata sila bak lara ter belau. Makang arti lah total mereka sulera rada la ministry lah hel. Tiada mlot mage ultar arti al ni arah tel Malaysia ini sebab luar belau. Esok aku lihat mung inak kemana MIF Shell wase ngurtu ram mering luar erer arah lah hel. Seral gotol tu dah kopi dekat wase ngerul basentra 
Rada si las mel mo el mother mo la tia racta el chumu choice sobre hablar bela. Era el base entre la otra bela ministerio de bela la se dura sin igual darte la da mos mera el chumte a mera hablar bela. Cada am de él va a ser a base entre el la cariol mera hablar bela mal me que cari. Di María de Silu. Sel de Silu vi a se. Kadang lot makal imol belum. Sehingga terasa bawa lelak lah, lelak mau buat ikan lah. Kadang kini ada orang mau lelak lah dia kadang buat ikan. Terasa bawa mask, kadang bawa mask. Bawa melbal, kadang bawa melbal. Terasa bawa aroi, kadang bawa aroi. Terasa bawa malah test, kadang bawa malah test. Eh mau belok melihat lagi kal building hospital, mau mal mau mal alam, nanti kita mal mau tengal mau malah test. Yangara quarantine, di doktor kuarter sel hotel, dah teringat ada belur belau, sel lama tu ada tok tang, ikut ada bela hotel Louis Lawrence. Mak malik Rembrandt kata orang Mayong yang masih doktor Roberts, doktor Yano, mak doktor kuarter masih sel hotel si rule ada bela Mumbai Yobor kami. Mak mungkin masih ada bela sel uktu ma mula amla liobo. Ikan itu mungkin tak kerap lular. Yang umral buat se, gigil ader belal melot mak, awul kata sel bakar, rata korak covid relan sil. Dia kami dah, pas kami apa kerap kerap tak? Mang way se, sel tunggu rata korak prevention eh, doktor kuarteng korak mal, korak mal beot. Sel sukum kata kata ramai sel meral me mal mau mada kiteri. Akora alat kiti kita le imolol do dul walau bentuk kalau spering. Sela saying the boiling frog syndrome. Kamla orang sih. Albe berata ya me. Terasa yang asyik dengan mawai sih. Sel boiling frog syndrome, ada ada lah ada ada. Ada ada al semua meng. Kadungul mati ral sel makayal deral ma. Hendi kul susuk keluar ma. Yang muda sih makayal. Hendi al semua meng kata. Kadungul leh ramakal kol deral ma. Mungkin kau kira al al Malaysia ranguil sel. Ram, en dia dia lebih mal mal malam berawal el mukadir engkau dia, tiada doktor kuarti, um dah saya sesat terus lagi tu sel, waktu ngurat tu orang NC dia belur bela, waktu ni seleng kami doktor mesra atau orang dah berik sel belur bela. Kedua seng dimran mau apa? Asukal rablur bela. Mung mula mau lui merul basen terad rablur bela. Asmel sukal. Eo kade ma elon mel basen tamu sukal. Kedua tal laboringa hearing ya doktor kuarter kedua seng song sa dialysis machine. Rah rah hospital. Aku mesa rekor dengan mel twenty nine atau twenty thirteen atau dengan mel mengara omsil kan. Ela tá na mão fora e tu. De ter que dar direito a estar a interesting a estatistic. Se ele não vai arar o grupo, ele quer ele omsil a tal milhão ele vai dar dar tel tela a estar lá. Se ele não tiver hospital, ele não vai dealing a a dar ele não vai arar o grupo omsil a ir o dar tel o gimel tela. Tiap malam mereka raga raga 2021. Ia kemudian sentelah sel actually belol hari hari ini tiada dal tiram sila. Mungkin meltelah. Mungkin dalam sahaja rata korai equity saya kira dal logger ini mergi dal bahasa seng mal mal. Kadang mungkin teratal million medal dar tertelah elendi. Sel tegar kering 
Jagabolo Golmel Telaim, Lingia Momasabaka Tirel, Tira Angara Oguru Actira Cielo, I say, um, Term Lomrega Raga, Sel Wal, Rangalela, a billing at the hospital, Malubun Giredel, El Charger, rather hospital, Girela Yellow Guru Nilai, a Girela Million. This is actual billing of the class sliding scale. I am a million. This is the first time I was in the hospital. I am a million. 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 I Akshara Igelen Batoga Al Bangalet. A question of Mergida was a Graigel Gida Matmokra de Kelsis. Mung Sebedan Motmage, Remula, Vesel ICU. Gadamarena Sulela, a government traveler of Shaval, and we thank you, uh, uh, Ambassador Orikasa, for the new ICU units at the hospital. And also the new uh, uh, CT scans and MRIs that will be implemented by the end of the year. With <laughs> Ambassador Lee, we thank the uh, government and the people of Taiwan for their tremendous support uh, in testing, laboratory equipment, and, and the new facilities that we also have uh, prepared uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. <laughs> and Ambassador Turner, we thank you for the, the electronic health records and the new IT system in the hospital that will help us be be ma better manage our healthcare system. Thank you. And, and Charles A. Bowner, we would uh, not have survived COVID without uh, tremendous support of the United States government in providing vaccines, providing professionals, and continuing to be really the, uh, providing the backbone of the support of our health centers, uh, our community health centers, and the many services of public health in our hospitals. So we want to thank the government of the United States. But, but to kay kagitan niya sa ulbang ay, di lakar af, and di kalsel, mungin lang matmok la uror. Makatama rin nga sulir ha, arado la uror hospital. And maring uror avek kalsel si Dr. Mayo. And di te, kadiri kalma di kasi, Tolong songs, ya betul kerana Israel, mengbring laurel recruit rara, dan dia kal bring laurel, wase material yang lagi ada mengarah dia kal top dalam luar bela di normal mall mengarah bela, meng senator kuarte, mengira dalam mall melosik kalau wase mengarah masa, gar-gar ini rara ada laurel rabek kecil, most importantly ada nak tirang ada hospital yang mengarah orang rabek kecil, I see. Ese amor, rado un cel gote el gariol, el libro audaud, el un olmer bap. Mga tambrin a suler adro olvir mla pasra, a minimum wage ra, second reading, so hopefully, pasra adur de mra albudula, a house. Ni, kida, adirega el modelo ase, Atara Kotrul Spale, Dr. Dever. Am CC, el school, ngara blur belal, help el trainer an galget. Makmal dirigen member, Dr. Dever, wase, gire del help ra PCC, el build ra arts and science college rim, un mose edel, el train, upgrade ra our medical professionals an gara alcela blur belal. So, Dr. Tela Gomez rega, maske, this year I will break ground the Rabbi Essel Arts and Car College uh, Science Building. So, the Marina Suler is a leader in Rabbi Taiwan and help her give the leader.
Pois é. Gada masalah atau telal Yerel tabsul atau telal lah merar betul. Se include ra ayer ngar alah dar hospital. Kita rada rablu amas per service hospital. Ya tu lolo ayer merar rablu ase. Tergi ngar rada dios per service hospital dah harau. Kamu malu bul ada di harau. Macam ni, ayer kompromi ngisel toy tu lolo ayer. Gire del mo understand dar ase tiap hospital ayer dar rogu. Ia dorogu ya kira dal, lo a imadri ni lo angar ale, ya part tercel sum ngaria, abil ergi dal mal, al boleh al sungu dal mlamu mereka kamil dil, ilak doa besar lo ase, a minister kafarang songsa, au do dal lo label om arakar, macam ni, sembel telal number bilun alastir komplo al misal dori, ten million, aku ada om segel bilun hospital alastir endim le eight million atau spe, rumah dal mal dengar dogon bo hospital yang adim lo mungkin besut endi, aku mending lo ase. Betul ka expense lagi, di mana kadu obes luasi, a hospital lagi, a health lagi, a dia kadu ilngar alel, a government. Hari apa bila time minister tabel wala kadu, kadu mula angal lagi, mereka odur odur clean mula school luasi, mula mungkin lagi lagi government. Gambar diri kadu lagi, kadu kadu mula choice lagi, tu muka kadu kadu. Kerja kita lor tua, amak kita rapat dengan, emla mau full tera minister ahel, emla mau full tera, emla mau tel melalui hospital, emla mau tel melalui doktor. Me, betul tera kerja dengan rapi beliau asyik tel rapat dengan, atau emplor aru bakal dios. Betul mungkin kerja ni, kerja ni amli si rapat dengan, lagi tu umrah lu asyik, a healthy nation is a wealthy nation. Or as Dr. Quarte would say, health is an asset. Nilaga dala lil mo liability rin yung mag. Mal mering asuliu. Looking forward to the summit, my girl. Tukal outcomes rin yung mo mo regal sa sector sa. Kung may masula. Masula nga His Excellency the President. Our next speaker will be speaking, giving his special keynote remarks of. Virtually. Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ebreyesus was elected WHO Director General for, fi for a five-year term by the WHO member states at the 70th World Health Assembly in May 2017. He was re-elected to a second term in May 2022 during the 75th World Health Assembly. Dr. Tedros was the first WHO Director General elected from among multiple candidates by the World Health Assembly and the first person from the WHO African region to head the world's leading public health agency. Born in the Eritrean city of Asmara, Dr. Tedros graduated from the University of Asmara with a Bachelor of Biology before earning a Master of Science in Immunology of Infectious Diseases from the University of London, a Doctorate of Philosophy in Community Health from the University of Nottingham, and the Honorary Fellowship from the Lond London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Following his studies, Dr. Tedros returned to Ethiopia to support the delivery of health services. First working as a first level mariologist, malaria, malaria, malaria logist, before uh, heading a regional health service and later serving in Ethiopia's federal government for over a decade as Minister of Health and Minister of Foreign Affairs. Prior to his election as Director General of WHO, Dr. Tedros held many leadership positions in global health, including as Chair of the Global Fund to Fight Against AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. He was also Chair of the World Back Malaria Partnership and Co-Chair of the Partnerships for Mater 
Maternal, Newborn, and Child Health Board. After taking office as WHO Director General, Dr. Tedros initiated the most significant transformation in the organization's history, which has generated a wide range of achievements. Please let's welcome Dr. Tedros. That's not him. <laughs> Just bear with us. Oh, oh, there he is. Thank you. Your Excellency, President Whips Jr., Honorable Minister Urbelao, Honorable Ministers, Excellencies, dear colleagues and friends. Thank you for the opportunity to share a few thoughts with you on the occasion of your first National Health Summit. All countries are trying, and many struggling, to catch up with the health-related targets in the Sustainable Development Goals, and especially the target of universal health coverage. Palau's strong sense of community, shared well-being and dedication to equity gives you a very strong foundation on which to build. Your focus on promoting health and addressing the drivers of disease is critical, especially those linked to climate change, non-communicable diseases, aging, and mental health. We also commend you for your response to COVID-19 with high vaccination coverage and strong surge management. The establishment of the CLEMAT emergency medical team also gives Palau the ability to serve and protect communities separated by hundreds of miles of ocean. I commend Your Excellency and the government of Palau for your leadership in the struggle for equity for small island states and for your progress on the path to universal health coverage. 75 years ago, WHO was founded on the conviction that health is not a privilege for some, but a right for all. WHO remains committed to supporting Palau to realize that right and to building a healthier, safer future for all your people. I thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Tedros. Uh, Dr. Tedros' message was pre-recorded and sent to us. Okay. To give us his uh, special remarks, we are honored to have Dr. Stevenson Quarte. Uh, Dr. Quarte is serving his second term uh, in the Senate. He is the chairman of the Senate Committee on Health and Social Welfare and is vice chairman of the Senate Committee on Foreign Affairs and State Matters. Senator Quarte earned his bachelor's degree in bi biology at Asbury College in Wilmore, Kentucky. He obtained his medical doctorate degree from the John A. Burns School of Medicine at the University of Hawaii and completed his residency in family practice at the San Bernardino County Medical Center in California. Please let's welcome the Honorable Dr. Quarte. I'm not more. Maluil tu tahun malam itu rawui. Yang itu tay bilung ah susam lah betul. Mandi aku kulo eh presiden website mal torak lemak ubal sih. Di 
malungit to tawag ko kami when sulat ka li siyot ay gingan mo. I was prepared to speak Palawan, but I think the target of my message is, uh, you will see, is to give a challenge to, to those who are in the health sector. First of all, I want to thank uh, His Excell Excellency President Whips and the Honorable Minister Erbalao uh, for their message earlier and the Director General from WHO. Speaking after them is not an easy task, but I must try. Even though they prepare and so there will be some plans interjected. I want to thank the organizers for the invitation to be here, and I'm honored to be here this morning. I'm invited this morning as Senator Quarte, and not necessarily Dr. Quarte. And therefore, in the next few minutes, I will talk about he health equity as a sen as Senator Quarte. My talk will be a summation, all of my experiences I've had in Palau, working, thinking, reading, and some instances, de designing the construct of what I think health should be for us and for our children. Slide two. The WHO defined health equity as absence of unfair, avoidable, remediable, remediable differences among population groups defined by social, economic, demography, demographic and geographic characteristics. The CDC agrees and defines health equity as the state of, uh, in which everyone has a, has a fair and just opportunity to attain the highest level of health. Tabasul, emalamal, talteal, el mosabil mongo ritmi, selgotel ngarbab, el toerahel. The CDC goes on to say that it Determinants of health, ayel over di la tora gurul, ahel, al influence ay gagi delto. Hindi ka lagurul wase economic policy and systems, developmental agenda, social norms and social policies, racism, climate change and political systems. In thinking through health equity, in pala my mind could not escape mil sa mosum whether health. Or is it wellness? Is it health equity or is it wellness equity? In the end, I chose that it is a wellness equity. Tabasul, el lulgarwil, aklangargit, or other bellow. Wellness is not defined by health or disease indicators. It is defined by the contentment. That's wellness. It's the contentment toward access to informed choices, freedom of choice, and a mitigated environment that allows for an easier, healthy choice to be made. To that extent, I decided, uh, I decided uh, Minister Werbelau, that I'm going to talk about wellness equity. Tabasul, Lulgarwil, Aklangaragidar, other Velo. Slide three. Okay. The achievement of wellness equity in Palau requires that the health sector take a community lead in, the follow in, in these following issues as guiding post to our national journey to make wellness achievable, measured, and maintained for our generation and the generations to come. These four issues are wellness as a national investment. We don't just invest in health, we make it our national investment. Wellness as a public good. 
Wellness is a public good. Sovereignty in wellness is an individual call for self-determination in wellness. Kawa a mega yel choice el swam el girel adru el lel aul la karwi la klang arau el other vela. And fourthly, wellness equity is a national action framework. Slide four. First, wellness is a national investment. Wellness must be identified, formalized, and pursued. Kadumo sigi, mo other dri, mo otiri, is a national investment. The pursuit of wellness should be a national policy at the highest level of our government. In 1979, the framers of the Palau Constitution wrote in Article 6, which is responsibility of the government, the national government shall take positive action to attain these national objectives, promotion of health and social welfare of citizens through provision of free or subsidized health care. In the second constitution in 2005, the second constitutional convention through the 24th amendment to the constitution said, the national government shall provide preventive health to every citizen as prescribed by law. Remember that is a fundamental right, it's in under article four. Next slide. Sorry about the busy slide, but as you go up there, you go off island and as you come here, you stay in the community. So just remember that. This in my mind sets one of the pillars of national building, making wellness a national investment in the pursuit of equity in wellness, a process to get there. Article six is the framework for disease management. Therefore, this is treatment and this is prevention are mentioned, are, are framed in article six. One of the enabling idea is the hospital authority that the president talked about. This is to strengthen secondary atora newing, matora referral, It's a strategy to strengthen clinical side and will control mortality rate. Say a a omroled el mo control e masad a odal rablur belo on the clinical side. For those who are in health sector that understand, currently most efforts, expenditures, technical assistance, consultancy, advocacy are about diseases. And correct me if I'm wrong. For example, our mortality data is readily available. Practically no one keeps and manages morbidity data. Kadang mending el was itu tel Adam lah, dia asal dari kantor was itu tel Amil Lord, tel Amil tu Warrior, tel tel Abi itu el ngara beli dia el altar. So what 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 is equity when it comes to mortality and morbidity? To achieve better outcome, health outcomes, equity in approach toward disease management and health ma management must exist. Ngira dalam mengaleo. The equity control of both mortality and morbidity should exist. Palau must approach a healthy person just as it does a sick person. Obviously, this cannot be achieved by the health sector alone. As the president said, it's all of us. Slide six. The second is wellness as a public good. Ngirela atwera held a wellness a ulagawila klang argit el model betlel telbulur belo. For those of you who are not sure, some doctor na bar ng amgasar gita mal medang liya bulgula adel adel betlel abulur belo ang lese komo extra doctor tele. Wellness has to be a public good. 
It should be a national policy because it allows wellness equity to be achieved. Wellness as a public good allows for individuals in our communities to pursue because it allows them to fulfill their individual and family potentials. Wellness as a public good is for communities to procure because it allows community to achieve their developmental goals. And wellness as a public good should be one of our de development, developmental pillars to achieve wellness equity. Have you noticed that if the power and the water is off, everybody goes haywire with PPUC? What about if some, uh, some of you see uh, a, a, a sick person? Do you call the Ministry of Health and complain all the time and no? Health is not at that level yet. As people have been assigned to be the caretaker of health, this is a message for all in the health sector, your advocacy must commence today that wellness is a public good. It must commence in this first Palau Health Summit that health wellness is a public good that is to be pursued and pursued relentlessly just as we do gross domestic products and other public goods. With a slide seven. The third is sovereignty in oneness. During the seventh public health uh, convention in November 2014, I spoke about sovereignty in health. And I said, sovereignty in health alludes to the achievement of wellness. Since that time, or achievement of health, since that time, I have changed from health to wellness. Maybe I just got older. It sovereignty in health alludes to the ability of people to live in a society where wellness is attainable through informed daily choices. It alludes to act active consciousness, making a healthy choice that are congruent with pursuit of wellness. It alludes to the freedom in making that decision because people possess the appropriate information, knowledge tools, and implementation to make their life better. This is the job of the health sector, to provide those tools. And to live fully responsible for the consequence of their decisions, just as the president said. And be content with the level of well-being that they choose for themselves and their family they should not be prescribed wellness as I feel they should. They should choose. This should be the pursuit of health sector in Palau because wellness is not about something adopting your version of wellness. It's about them possessing the sovereignty to think, to choose, to act, and be happy. Slide eight. Yakotel so al slide, eh, Vice President, na masada equality ma equity, eh. Kadi di bulo la segida equal. Magadal mo legal, eh, step segida mo osisiu. En gagidal gagadabal wa nga kadirak dirak sa lo mesa game. Eh, kung ako ang nurse sa bital ng gagil nga katui kani, eh, kung la mga kita point, eh. The fourth, eh, Mr. President, and I, I, I apologize for taking a long time. Wellness equity has to be a national action framework. Serious consideration should be given to wellness equity as a national action framework. Pursuing equity in co-managing disease and health, co-managing mortalities and morbidities, co-managing lifestyles and remove, will remove most of the inequities of wellness. We talk about disparities because we're talking about ethnic groups and colors and all of this. If we just take a look at equity in morbidity and mortality, co-managing health and disease, and co-managing all the life cycle, I think all of those disparities will follow, fall, fall away. It removes disparities that we so common, we so common find in providing health services such as demographics, ethnicities, economics, gender, 
vulnerability, climate change, and others. If I'm talking about the healthy and the unhealthy, everybody's included. Doesn't matter who you are, whether you have money or not. I think, Minister, maybe that is the, the way to go. Last slide. Let me conclude by saying, in my whole opi uh, humble opinion, that this 2023 Health Summit, wellness should be, a, should be proclaimed as a national investment. If, the, if Palau can make PNMS a national investment, then why not wellness? Why not wellness? For, for the minister to seriously advocate to the highest level of this government that wellness equity be a policy at this highest level of uh, leadership. That wellness is pursued as a public good as we do water, electricity, and for goodness sake, even sewer. How come wellness is not there? This allows for individuals to procure in their goal to become self-determined and to be content in their life, in the life they choose for themselves and their family. Achievement of sovereignty in wellness is not a goal, but a process of self-determination in wellness. Wellness equity ought to be, ought not to be the semantics of the summit, but rather a call to a national action framework toward achievement of wellness as a national objective. I leave that to Comrade Misula. Thank you, uh, Senator Quarte. Uh, our next on the agenda, uh, before we get to there, I uh, just want to take this time and to recognize the two chairpersons of uh, our health summit, uh, namely uh, Dr. Adelbay uh, uh, Fraser, who is uh, our internist at the Benau, Benau National Hospital. Along with her as co-chairperson is our director of public health, Sherilyn Madraiso. We just want to thank them for bringing together the summit. Thank you. Okay, so now I will give the, yield the floor to the mic to Dr. Alibai Fraser, who will be giving us an overview of the conference. Thank you. We're just doing this to feel too tau. Uh, I'm very happy to see all the beautiful and handsome faces this morning. I will be giving a brief overview of our conference. The Ministry of Health and the Human uh, Services is extremely excited, and I personally am extremely excited uh, that we are hosting our first Health Equity Summit with everybody, including our community partners. This event aims to bring awareness and importance, um, importance to some of the health issues that we are seeing in our community and also how do, we, how do we bring positive changes by closing equity gaps and especially in healthcare access. And as a doctor, as healthcare workers, we feel this is a very good platform to bring all of these discussions. Our goal is to gain as much insight and guidance from you, from everybody, our partners, and how do we move forward with a strong health equity lens. I will list down our primary objectives, and they are as follows. So number one, raise awareness about health equity and disparities through topics focused on public health, prevention, clinical application, applications, policy and systems change, research, and so forth. Secondly, to provide meaningful networking with an opportunities network and opportunities with our partners and collaboration. Thirdly, to identify paths to improve health through health system strengthening. And lastly, to live with an understanding of health equity, clear outcomes, and renewed partnerships. So speakers today will represent academia, public health, 
um, non-profit organization, community organizers, um, organizations, businesses, and community members who are here. The three-day summit will provide the audience with, the, with leading voices in overcoming obstacles on in inequities and sharing the latest ideas and success stories. And breakout sessions are also packed with insights and ideas that you can bring back to your organizations and communities and uh, to help accelerate equity in your settings. And I also want to highly encourage that this is our opportunity to um, do peer networking especially uh, moving to uh, especially how to work towards some of our challenges and oppor and to seek opportunities to some of the issues that means the most to us so um, again i'm very excited to see you all sorry i'm i am a little bit nervous because this is probably my first time to see myself on a big screen and to see such a big crowd <laughs> in a while and uh, we do um, hope to see you uh, in our sessions in the next three days and we are looking forward to a lot of the positive outcomes uh, after our summit. And thank you. Thank you very much. Masula. Mm -mm. Thank you, uh, Dr. Adelbai Fraser. Um, ladies and gentlemen, how about we give him another hand of applause? Thank you, everybody. Um, we are a little bit ahead of our schedule. Uh, but before we do take a break, a 15-minute break, I just want to make a couple of announcements. Uh, there will be a bus uh, schedule posted at the registration area. Uh, those buses will be taking uh, participants from, from here to the different break breakout venues. There's going to be three uh, different venues for the breakout sessions. All plenary sessions will happen here uh, at the main hall. Uh, from uh, early morning, 8, 8 a.m. to 12 noon. The breakout sessions will be happening at, from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. in the afternoons at those different venues. So please look at the bus schedule and um, all the details of the breakout sessions and the plenary sessions uh, can be found online. Um, all the details are there at the palauhealthsummit.com. Uh, our website will provide you um, all the, uh, the details of the breakout sessions, and the including the plenary sessions. Um, yes, lunch will be served uh, here at the main hall. Uh, again, the restrooms are next to the registration area. Um, once again, thank you for attending this morning. Uh, thank you to our uh, speakers. Um, we will take a 15-minute break and be back here uh, for the rest of the program. Thank you, everybody. Again, it's a 15-minute break, and we will have uh, draffle drawings as well. There's some uh, awesome prizes to give away.
Ali, everybody. If I can ask everybody to please uh, take their seats. Um, ask those still at the back area to please uh, make your way back in so we can uh, resume our program. Thank you. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, before we uh, continue with the program, uh, I would like to move, just make a few announcements and a couple of uh, uh, corrections to the agenda. Uh, the further details with uh, what the Dr. Adelbai Fraser uh, uh, gave us this morning. So it's day. Uh, it's day of the summit. Uh, uh, there is a summary page including plenary sessions and breakout sessions. Uh, all plenary sessions, like I mentioned earlier, will be here at the Palau National Gym. Uh, all plenary sessions are in the morning till noon, and after the break sessions, at, they resume at 3.30 to 4.30. Again, uh, afternoon. Uh, plenary sessions will be here at the Balao National Gym uh, starting from 3.30 to 4.30 p.m. Uh, registration uh, opens at 7.15 in the morning, every morning of the summit, uh, from 7.15 to 8.15. Um, we will be serving uh, breakfast, so please do join us for breakfast and do some networking. Uh, all detailed information can be found in subsequent pages, and these pages are uh, indicated on the summary page for each day. Okay. Uh, do note that there are no breaks indicated in these uh, detailed pages, but they are on the summary pages only. So do, know, do make note of those. There will be one break in the morning and one in the afternoon. Uh, some of these breaks will include activities, and those will be facilitated by our uh, behavioral health uh, unit. Okay. Uh, again, breakout sessions are between 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, each day, and they will uh, be at various places. Uh, some will be at the Palau National Gym here. Uh, some will be at the Palau Community College Assembly Hall. Uh, PCC Conference Room, PCC Cafeteria, the C Civic Center, the Ngara Mayong uh, 
cultural center main hall uh mura akarngab room and there's also a classroom where some of the breakout sessions will happen will take place again so look at your agendas uh, for locations descriptions of the sessions and uh, the speakers and the presenters for those uh, for each of those breakout sessions okay you can find uh, the the uh, the agenda will be uh, updated uh, uh, and you can find those updates at, the, at our website which is uh, palauhealthsummit.com updated uh, updates will be there at the at the website okay um, we do want to make uh, error uh, co make corrections to our errors on the agenda the program we do apologize uh, sell, uh, on page 10 sell psychological first aid uh, that's happening at 1 p.m. at the PCC conference room uh, the presenter is by Lassel and not by Lassau his name is by Lassel Oche Tumu we do apologize Oche uh, on page 14 quitting tobacco for youth 2 p.m. Ngaramayong Gorangab room uh, that will be presented by uh, by Lassel and Ripka Quintaro. Uh, Ripka, Ripka Quintaro is the program manager for uh, the addiction services unit at the behavioral health unit services. Okay, I'd like to remind everybody to please come back uh, after those breakout sessions. Be here at 3 p.m. Um, we do have a couple of uh, raffle prizes that are sponsored by our partner, uh, MD, uh, 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 MD Services. Okay, so uh, again, uh, lunch will be served here. Yes. Uh, Transportation, again, like mentioned earlier, uh, there's going to be bus transportation between uh, venues um, in the afternoon. So again, those uh, schedules are posted at the registration area, and those uh, folks at the registration table can assist you with those details. All right. Again, we want to remind everybody we do have we do have uh, water dispensers, but we are not giving away, uh, we do not have cups for drinking water. So if you could please bring your own water bottle, that would uh, help us tremendously. Okay, uh, the cups from the coffee shops uh, are just for them. So if you have a water bo bottle, uh, I think in your bags that you were given at registration should have a water bottle in them. If not, please, please bring your own water bottle. Thank you. Okay, if I could ask one of the ladies to bring in, we will do a couple of raffle prices before we go on with our agenda, our next speaker. Thank you. Okay, so if you're the lucky uh, winner, uh, on the left corner of this room, uh, you can claim your prices there. Good luck, everybody. Okay. Please take out your raffle tickets. The winning number is six. Is that five or six? Okay, sorry. Five, four, six, seven, zero, five, nine. Five, four, six, seven, zero, five, nine. Do we have a winner? Again, the number is 546-7059. Yeah? OK, we'll, we'll take the next ticket number. OK, the first giveaway. Oh, there. Do we have a winner? All right. Me. 
Okay, please claim your prize. Congratulations. Please claim your prize at MD Hall Sales. Oh, MD Hall Sales, eh? Uh, you've just won yourself a cash price of twenty dollars. Okay. Okay. Our next winning number is five four six seven two two six. Five four six seven two two six. I see a hand raised up. Okay, congratulations. You too have won yourself a cash prize of $20. All right, congratulations to our winners. Okay. One more. How about we do one more? Okay, number 5466970. Five four six six nine seven zero. We have a winner over there. Congratulations. Okay. You have won yourself a JBL uh, speaker. Okay, let's continue with our program. Um, our next uh, item on the agenda is the overview of health equity, island equity uh, framework. And this is gonna be given to us by Carl Ensign, who is Vice President of Island Support Association of state and territorial health uh, officials. Carl Ensign from ASTO. Please take that seat. Thank you. Thank you. Salam. <laughs> Great. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Carl Ensign, Vice President of Island Support at ASTO, Ali. It's so good to be back in Palau. Um, and uh, I just want to emphasize when we got the invitation for this, how honored we were to be here. This is so groundbreaking to be talking about this important issue um, with everything else that's going on here within the last few years. I really think that Palau is stepping up and leading the way, not only in this jurisdiction, but in the Pacific uh, region and nationally. And um, it's really significant that you all have shown up, have an interest in this, and that we have leadership from the various highest levels of government. So I'd give yourselves a round of applause. With me today, I also have Julia Von Alexander, who will be presenting just a couple of slides with respect to an island health equity framework that she's been working on. So we'll be doing that a little bit later. Um, I also want to salute the tremendous effort that I think the, the Pacific region really led the nation, if not the world, in terms of its COVID response. The fact that you kept COVID at bay for so long with such decisive leadership until we had the therapeutics and vaccines and protocols in place, rep re repatriation was handled in an extremely innovative way with the qu double quarantining in Honolulu and here. I really want to salute the leadership of the government again and also the ministry and our minister, uh, Gafar Urbalao,
for all of the work that you all have done on his team to keep the population safe and mitigate this global pandemic. So again, a round of applause on that. And with COVID receding, I think we need to turn that same energy to other health emergencies that are out here. I know PHOA, the Pacific Island Health Officers Association, which is also in attendance, has renewed their commitment to the public health emergency in this area. And we need to keep that same commitment with reducing NCDs and other public health threats. So let's keep it going. And again, take a breath, but let's keep it going. And that's why we're here today. So if I could have the, um, the next slide, please. What we really hope to do today is have a shared understanding of what health equity is within an island context. We want to provide some overview of health equity and what those terms mean and provide some concrete examples of primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention with respect to health equity. Um, we want to talk about ASTO's island health equity framework, which is really your framework that we've developed very closely with you to try to translate these terms into an island context. And we also want to underscore efforts to advance health equity that are being undertaken in the states and the islands. Just if I could have the next slide, I want to tell you a little bit about what ASTO is and who I am. So ASTO is the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. We represent the 59 health officials throughout the states, territories, and freely associated states. Minister Gafaru Balau is our member, one of those 59. We work in close partnership out here with our sister organization, POA, the Pacific Island Health Officers Association. We're really the only national nonprofit representing the nation's health at the state level. Uh, and we were officially born in March 23rd, 1942. But before that, as far back as 1879, health officials realized that infectious disease did not respect traditional geographic boundaries and they began convening unofficially through the American Medical Association conferences to trade secrets, to trade intel, to try to work together, uh, especially on the uh, cholera outbreak in the Mississippi Valley. Today, ASTO supports island health officials in health and racial equity in terms of workforce development, sustainable infrastructure improvements, data modernization and interoperability, evidence-based practice, our, our staff represent subject matter experts from the full spectrum of uh, the public health enterprise. My job as uh, vice president for island support is to really make sure that all of the services, programs, capacity building assistance we provide is relevant to our island jurisdictions in the Atlantic and the Pacific. So we really wanna make sure it's relevant and works for you. We wanna hear from you. So, so grateful to be here so that we can learn more about how you view health and health equity and the steps we need to take and how we can be of greater assistance going forward. So I can take that message back. Um, so if I could have the next slide, we'll just do some definitions. Now we've already had some excellent definitions of what health equity means and I love the framing by uh, Senator Carte, wellness as a, as a public good and as a national goal. Um, I'm going to provide some more traditional examples of health equity, starting with ASTOs, which is health equity is when everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible in a society that values each member equally through focused and ongoing efforts to address avoidable inequities, historical and contemporary injustices, and the elimination of disparities in health and health care. And we've adapted that from several frameworks, including the CDC, Healthy People 2030 and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And what I see in this is the, the statement up front that we, have, we need to work on fair and just opportunity with respect to health, and then we need to move quickly into addressing inequities, both historical and contemporary, and eliminating disparities. And what I hope to do in my remarks is provide some examples of how we can do that together. Also want to, if I could have the next slide show up the uh, throw the, show the World Health Organization definition of health equity, and you'll see they have that same uh, two-part, if you will, where the, the full potential for health and well-being is emphasized, and then immediately moving to action. Progressively realizing that this right means systematically identifying and eliminating inequities resulting from differences in health and overall living conditions. So we need to get at the root cause of what is causing us to have these health inequities. 
And um, let's, so what I'd like to do next is just turn to a, a couple of frameworks that look at the levels of prevention, which is an important concept when we're gonna start to dig down and get at the root causes of health inequities, and also the social determinants of health, which has been mentioned earlier. So if I could have the next slide. The levels of prevention is a useful framework for identifying how health and public health can help create conditions allowing people to be as healthy as possible. So if you look here, you see that we have primary, secondary, and tertiary defined. So those are our levels of prevention. Um, we tend to think of primary as being upstream and tertiary as being downstream. I really liked uh, Senator Carte's acknowledgement that when you're dealing with primary, you're dealing with people in their communities on island. The more you move uh, uh, to tertiary, secondary and tertiary, you're looking at off-island care, or hospital care. So I think that's an important concept. Upstream, downstream, on-island, off-island is a way to look at that. Um, so some traditional examples of primary prevention uh, where we're preventing de disease or injury from occurring would be policies to ban hazardous products, education awareness programs, vaccines for infectious disease, housing and income protections. Secondary, detect, treat disease or injury to reduce impact would be starting to move into screening tests, getting people into the services, programs, and treatments they need. Nutrition and exercise for certain health conditions with respect to malnutrition, hypertension, diabetes. Modifying the environment to, pr to promote health contract tracing and mandated infectious disease treatment, for instance, with respect to tuberculosis. And then when you get into tertiary care, we're talking about chronic disease management uh, with respect to diabetes, hypertension, or um, dementia or depression. Rehabilitation programs and support groups, treatment for disease or injury, and um, safe playgrounds, walkable streets, housing repairs for asthma. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm sorry about that. If I could just take this out, maybe, but I'll make. Okay. That would be great. I kind of would like to walk around if I could. No problem. Other side. <laughs> I do this a lot. Can you hear me? Is it on? Very good. Okay, sorry about that. I do want to make sure everyone can hear. So if I could have the next, um, if we could advance the slide. Now, what we're going to do is provide some COVID-19 examples with respect to levels of prevention. I think I'm getting some feedback here. Okay, so if we're talking about primary prevention under levels of prevention with respect to COVID-19, that would be regarding mask rules, quarantine requirements, education about COVID-19 safety, prioritizing vaccines for those most likely to be exposed, such as those working in service industry. Um, and, and so those would be the primary stream in terms of COVID-19 examples. Secondary would be readily available testing for COVID-19 um, and um, other strategies with respect to primary. Um, uh, testing for COVID-19 education um, and symptoms and treatment, isolation requirements. And then tertiary would be treatment for COVID-19 and long haul symptoms, continued education for chronic conditions, respite care for caregivers. So again, we're moving from primary to tertiary. And that's one of the things we wanna think about with health equity is we need to kind of work on all those streams um, simultaneously. Is it coming through the live feed or am I creating feedback? We're okay? Very good, thank you. Okay, so if I could have the next slide, we're gonna keep moving. Now let's talk about the social determinants of health. And especially the social determinants of health are, are uh, important to think of in terms of where we focus on with primary prevention along with those factors that impact secondary and tertiary outcomes. So social determinants of health, and we saw a slide on this earlier, um, Healthy People 2030 collects data in all these areas. But we're really thinking about healthcare, the five pillars of healthcare access and quality, neighborhood and built environment, social and community context, economic stability, education access and quality. And the WHO, the World Health Organization and CDC, 
refer to the social determinants of health as the conditions in the environment where people are born, live, work, play, worship, and age. And they affect a wide range of health functioning and quality of life outcomes and risks. So where we are born, live, work, play, worship, and age determines those social, con that social context determines our health outcomes. So if we are going to unravel some of this and create equality, we need to think about that from the very beginning, from the very environment in which people spend the majority of their time, in which they are born, raised, and eventually pass. So what I'd like to do now is overlay the levels of prevention, if I could have the next slide, uh, with the COVID examples and the social determinants of health lens. So here we have what we just went through, the levels of prevention, kind of how they're traditionally defined in the COVID-19 examples. Now if we could advance it one more time, we'll overlay the social determinants of health. So if we could have the next slide. So with a social determinants of health lens, if we're talking about um, primary prevention, um, we might, in COVID-19 examples, we might offer business loans and grants to encourage quarantining to, re to kind of relieve some of that economic burden, addressing vaccine hesitancy through trust building and reconciliation of past harms, reaching people homebound for vaccines. So that would be sort of the primary layer if we were to think about a social determinant of health lens with respect to the, to the levels of prevention. Secondary, we could prioritize, if we only had so much testing to go around, we could prioritize testing for people with high exposure jobs, again, grocers, restaurant workers. Um, we could identify safe and inclusive social activities so that people could continue to have social movement and physical movement that would keep them safe. And then, of course, if we're going to think about our tertiary line, which we also need to think about, we need to think about long-term COVID and the health impacts of those living with COVID um, and continuing to treat those conditions which exacerbate COVID, uh, mental health treatment and support, uh, those with chronic uh, disease, et cetera, et cetera. So what we're beginning to do is think about primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention, social determinants of health, and what that means with respect to health equity, which is sort of this concept that everyone should have an equal opportunity for health. So let's try to put that all together, and that's where we're gonna move next. So here we have one of the leading um, frameworks, as we call it, of health equity. And you'll see right away that I don't think this reflects the island culture, right? You have big buildings and that sort of thing. Um, and so what we are doing here at ASTO, and Julie is gonna present this in just a second, is to work on an island health equity framework to help us guide our work and track where we're going and prioritize where we want to be. But I want to point out we have the upstream and the downstream from left to right. So again, on island to off island, um, and trying to move backwards. That's one of the things that I think the Bar High, the Bay Area um, uh, Regional Health Equity Framework emphasizes. The circle then are those social determinants of health that are um, where we come from and where we spend our time and our living conditions. And then coming up from the bottom are those levers that we can use to enact change. So strategic partnerships and advocacy, community capacity building, inviting the community, joining with the community to work on inequities, to get at the root cause, to identify the root cause, policy, and then moving downstream, we have individual health education, health care, and case management. All of this is to say that we all tend to um, focus up here under current health practice. And if we're ever gonna get ahead on this, we really need to keep moving backwards to the beginning and see what's causing these inequities and address them where they occur so that people can be healthy within their communities and their families. That's the secret here, that's the ticket. And that's hard work and it's counterintuitive, but it's also very rewarding and I think that's what this convening is all about, really is beginning to think through these complex issues and how we can work together to begin to make outroads, inroads that will then pay off enormous dividends as people age and grow 
in a healthy environment. So um, that's what I would call sort of a state-centric um, um, model. And we're going to get into an island one. But first I want to say that, um, you know, ASTO's mission uh, to, uh, to advance health equity and work with our members, these are some of the leading um, strategies stateside that we think could have the biggest impact with some of the things I just talked about from a, from a state public health agency perspective. So this is not an exhaustive list, but this is what we encourage our members to look at. So one of the first things is just to make sure that you have the race and ethnicity data that, so that you can track where you need to go and what you need to do and how you're doing. And that might be in state immunization, electronic laboratory reporting, electronic case reporting systems, et cetera. So you've got to have the data. Another th thing to think about is really joining with the community and enlisting a cadre of experienced um, community public health workers who can carry the work out into the communities and meet people where they live so that they don't have to go to the hospital as often, so their conditions don't escalate to that or go off island. So really building a healthy community public health workforce is key to this as well. Thirdly, thirdly is just continuing to expand all the work we do to have a stronger focus on health equity and to really think beyond just sort of treating the disease category for which we receive funding, but what's causing that and moving downstream. Upstream, I'm sorry. And policies like expanding sick leave and family leave to more workers through policy interventions is another one. So that's what's happening nationally and stateside. And then from here on out, what we're going to talk about is what's happening within islands in the Pacific and the Atlantic. So if I could have the next slide. Um, we, um, at ASTO, we are funded now to provide capacity building and technical assistance support to our members um, as they undertake health equity um, practice. And there's some funding that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has released in that area. We call it the 2103 funding, but I'll just call it the health equity funding. And um, so we received this funding to provide capacity building assistance. And the first thing we wanted to do was to gather sort of all the stakeholders together, much like this, in the Atlantic region and the Pacific region and hear from them. So we, we called in our health leadership, Minister Gaffar, as you can see, was there. You also see uh, Director San Augustine from Guam in the upper right-hand corner. We called them in and, and some key staff into Guam here in the Pacific. We involved funders from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And we've involved other stakeholders, such as our sister organization, PIHOA, Pacific Island Health Officers Association. We asked them what health equity meant for them, where they plan to go with their work plans, and how we could be of assistance. And that's where we began to develop this health equity framework that I want to talk about um, here. So um, if I could have the next slide, and then I think I'll turn it over to Julia. The island health equity framework, and it's, it's so that's great. We've got resources coming in from on high <laughs> as I speak. <laughs> the Island Health Equity Framework will help guide ASTO's work on health equity, support and guide island health agency work, provide a foundation for understanding health equity within the islands, and it's a tool to create buy-in and shared understanding with partners and funders. So remember I showed you that bar high framework, which included the levels of prevention, social determinants of health, it had the buildings on it and how you can move upstream and downstream. Now what we'd like to do is present a framework that is island specific. And we've done that with our health officials and staff to, and we began to do that at the regional convenings which I talked about earlier so that we can have something to kind of orient our work. So I'll turn it over to my colleague, Julia Von Alexander for a couple of slides and then we'll wrap this up. Thank you, Carl. And I do want to reiterate Carl's thanks. I'm so grateful to be here and to be learning from and with all of you. I've been very inspired by the remarks that have already been made. So really appreciate all the work that everyone here is doing. 
Uh, and so we developed this framework based on feedback from island health officials and health agency staff. We also built on the frameworks that Carl went through, like the Bar High framework, although that one is a little bit more focused on disparities. And so we wanted to focus on equity and really see how do we get to equity? Where are some action points? And I actually need the next slide, please. So. We put together this framework and categorized it the best that we could, given the feedback that we had. We know that this doesn't include every possible thing that could affect health equity. We couldn't fit all of those on one graphic, but we did want to include some things that would be more important for the island areas, things that really affect health equity here in Palau, in the Pacific, and in the Atlantic. So we really wanted to highlight those things. And we also recognize that some things may, you may think it fits in another category, or it can help or hinder health equity. Um, we've done our best to put together these categories just to support clarity. And like I said, we really want you to be able to use this framework for action in order to identify some of those root causes so that you can work together with agencies, including the health ministry, but also ministries like the Ministry of Justice or the Ministry of Education. Uh, because as uh, Senator Cortez said, it's not just healthcare. We need everyone to move towards health equity. And so we do have these arranged. Oh, can we go back? I'm still on that one slide. <laughs> um, so we have things like foundational conditions in here. So those are some individual characteristics. They're the baseline of the community here in Palau. Things like age, or race and ethnicity, or the language people speak, and their literacy level. Um, the next thing I want to highlight is strengths and supports, because we're not starting from zero. Here in Palau, there is great community-based organizations and groups, like your faith-based groups, or your men's and women's interest groups. Um, and there are many folks here that are part of those groups. Um, there's also a shared culture and history. And we see here there's community mobilization and ownership. I'm so impressed by how many people turned out um, for this conference. And so really, I think we're starting from a great place. Um, there's also strong community ties and support. So really want to highlight those, because those are things that you can use to build towards health equity. I um, also want to highlight some societal conditions. So those are changeable characteristics, kind of that social and community context from the social determinants of health. And those affect health equity. Um, so things like environmental protection, or religious affiliations and beliefs, or reliable power um, are all really important pieces uh, for health equity. Uh, and I'll also move to institutional influences, which I mentioned briefly, but we all know that our ministries and government have an influence on health and how healthy people can be, as well as the healthcare um, and hospital. So um, pieces like housing or laws and regulations that Congress makes or schools um, are big influences around health equity. And so it's exciting to have so many people here from all of those different partners um, so that we can be moving forward together with that shared understanding of where we're going, uh, which was so beautifully outlined by our speakers this morning. And then we also did want to recognize that there are some external factors. There are things that you can't control fully on the island. So climate change is definitely a big one. I know there's been a lot of work here to um, combat that, but it is a big overarching piece. Additionally, a reliance on food imports. Similarly, I know y'all are working to reduce that, but it has been a big influence. And then also, as Carl mentioned, things that are more state-centric, so they don't necessarily take the full needs and strengths of the island into context, and so funding might not be quite right, or the program model might be need to be adjusted. And I will say, um, ASTO does try to work on those things, and so we want to work hand-in-hand -hand with you to um, move towards a better space with that. 
And finally, I want to end on a good note with the facilitating factors. And so these are things that can help us move towards health equity and that you all are integrating here today. Um, things like policy development and advocacy. I heard some of that earlier, and I know that there's a session later this week on policy systems and environmental change. Um, also, using data for decision making. So we saw some data this morning. That's really important to consider, and I know there are also some sessions on data. So if you're interested in that, I definitely recommend. And finally, community partnerships and engagement. As we've already noted, there are so many great partners and engaged community here today. Next slide, please. So in the island areas, we've seen three really major ways that um, islands are working on this. So folks in the Atlantic and in the Pacific. Um, Two are things that I just highlighted around using data for decision making, and some of that is around creating data dashboards or health equity indicators, and then also engaging community partners. So working with health equity advisory groups and community health workers to really get out into the community and hear from people and build trust. And then finally, it's also important to consider how to make this work sustainable and to have dedicated staffing. And so one aspect of that is braiding and layering funding, which means you're pulling funding from different sources, recognizing that health equity is not just in one program, it is across the entire agency. And so that's one way to kind of have more sustainable funding for health equity. Next slide, please. And so we did want to highlight a couple of examples of work in the islands. So in Puerto Rico, they are working to build a data dashboard. And they're using some of the existing data that they have and working with a partner. Um, they want to include data around social determinants of health to really help get to the root causes of uh, the disparities that are highlighted within the dashboard. And they're also hoping that it can help their community groups by letting their community know, um, getting the data, knowing what the disparity is, so they can change their programs or adapt and make decisions based on that, um, as well as being able to apply for funding, because funders often ask for data. Uh, and so ASTO has supported this work through a workshop series where we've talked about staff capacity, so having the ability to even manage this dashboard, um, done some inventories around data, so getting clear on who has what data and how to get it, um, defining a purpose for the dashboard so that the data is actually being used for decision making, and uh, designing the dashboard so that people see themselves represented in it in a way that they want to be represented and feel a sense of belonging. Um, and so one key takeaway is just that it's helpful to identify any other efforts that are going on around data dashboards in the community. Um, also considerations are just, like I said, staff capacity and what data there is access to and what partners you might want to work with. And I do want to commend Palau on the work that you're doing around health equity indicators because that's a great start to this piece of using data for decision making. Next slide, please. So another piece is the community engagement and engagement with partners. And one big piece of this is community health workers. So I was so excited to see the community health workers here introduced today. And I look forward to learning more about their work. Um, similarly, CNMI Guam and the US Virgin Islands are actually starting to use community health workers more. And um, they're idea with this is to connect geographically isolated populations and those who have been most impacted by COVID-19 with services and resources. And so some ways that ASTO has supported that is by connecting health agency staff with other health agency staff either in the Pacific or in the states. We've had some great conversations and also sharing some of the existing trainings and resources. I know it can be hard with um, getting trainings from the continental US, so we found some that are pre-recorded. Um, 
And there is a lot of great work going on with community partners. Um, Puerto Rico is working to contract with community-based organizations they hadn't before, um, and so we've supported them in that. Um, and the U.S. Virgin Islands is doing things similar to this. They held a symposium um, in August and introduced their vision and their community health workers there too. And they're also hosting regional summits. So a lot of great work in the island areas as well as what's going on here. So I um, want to commend you all as well. And with that, I'll pass it back to Carl. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Julia, for your work on that important um, island health equity framework. I think it'll be a real contribution, <clears throat> not only to your work, but to the field as well nationally, the health equity field, to um, think about the island context and, and start to include that. And the, the other thing I wanted to underscore is it shows both things we need to work on, the negatives and the positives. There's, there's so many things that are positive out here that we can build on that provide a strong foundation of community support and cohesion that we can, we can build on. So the last thing we wanted to talk about um, <clears throat> in those, those three examples of sort of leading strategies that we're seeing so far unfold within an island context aimed at reducing health equity is to just work on the basic infrastructure. The, the funding for health equity that was released by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is going to go away. It's time limited, unfortunately. And so what we need to do is braid and layer or weave this work into our ongoing work and find ways to continue to fund it. And I really wanted to highlight the work by the uh, Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Island CNMI in terms of braiding and layering. What they did is they took their non-communicable disease. So here you have the sections of their organizations across uh, uh, the programs and services, how they've reorganized. And what they did is they took their non-communicable disease branch and they reorganized it so it wasn't just focused on cancer and, and on the, those non-communicable hypertension, et cetera, et cetera. They reorganized it into four pillars of healthy communities, health management, surveillance and evaluation, health promotions, and community relations. So they took all their program and disease-specific funding and they wove it to address these four pillars in a way that I think provides an example of how we can keep this work going. So when they go back to the funders, they can track where the funding went for the original program intent. But to the client, it is seamless and comprehensive. And we know that when we are trying to address health inequities and work towards a place of health equity and move upstream and move into communities that we're often stymied by these um, funding structures that are disease or condition specific that are time limited. And so we really need to get creative on our end to think about how we can take that funding and make it so that it works for the community and the individual. And what that might mean is that a community health worker who's doing an assessment does several assessments at once. And then that is funded through the separate funding streams that will do a cancer screening or that will do an, even an HIV screening. Combine those all into one and then serve people in a way that makes sense that routes them to the services they need. And that's a way of sustaining our health equity efforts. So what ASTO is doing is, um, you know, we're publicizing CNMI's efforts. We are, um, have done an, an article on braiding and layering, and we're also creating a rich resource library that's on the web that will show you how to kind of go through the steps of funding a health equity office and then sustaining it through multiple funding streams that could use this service going forward. What's really key to that is leadership. We need leadership from the highest levels to be on board with that. And then that creates the vision for people to combine funding in a way that makes sense to everyone involved and really creates better programs that are client-centered and sustainable. So that's it for our presentation. If we go to the next slide, yeah, that's it. Um, what we wanted to do today, again, in, in just to review, was to provide some definitions of health equity, building on some of the definitions we heard from the president and the senator and others, and then talk about um, how we go from there to developing a health equity framework. And that meant looking at the levels of prevention. So we need to work on multiple fronts at once, primary, secondary, tertiary. And we need to think about the social determinants of health that have 
really predetermine where people are and start to begin to unravel those. And that means involving everyone in this. It means everyone has a role in this um, and creating a shared vision and moving forward. And that's what a health equity framework is then. It's the vision where we can orient our work, prioritize our work, and communicate our work and the outcomes we're achieving. I'm really looking forward to the uh, days ahead, to be here, to learn. It's so great to be back in Palau. It's been a while um, since COVID shut everything down, but it's so nice to be back. We arrived a little bit early and got to see the Rock Islands. I said to my colleagues, you, you have to snorkel and kayak in the Rock Islands, so we did that. Um, and we went to the museum yesterday, and uh, it's just so nice to be back here and really looking forward to this convening and spending time with everyone here. Thank you so much. Once again, we thank you both for your presentations. Uh, while we're going to set up the next uh, presentation, uh, we're going to go ahead and do two more uh, uh, ruffle drawings. If you take out your tickets, please. I'll take care of those later. So the first number is 5467243. Oh, are you not the winner if I speak? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Five, four, six, seven, two, four, three. Oh, thank you, Ajay. Dial Makmura next. Oh, do we have a winner? Okay, thank you. Dibora MD Hall says, claim your prize, please. Thank you. Our next winning number is five, four, six, seven, zero, two, three. Seven, zero, two, three. Would you have a winner? No? Okay, we do have a winner. Okay, the claim a price at MD wholesale table. Thank you. Uh, we just want to uh, remind everybody uh, our password for the Wi Fi is MHHS Palau 2023. That's the password for the, the Wi Fi. Okay. Um, just want to remind also that all our guest speakers' bios and pictures will be on the website or it will be uploaded eventually. So you can uh, read up on them, see their pictures online. Thank you. Okay, our next talk is gonna be on uh, redesigning health systems or building blocks for health equity. And this is coming to us virtually uh, and presented by Dr. Rajas Narwal. And let's just wait for the IT to set up the presentation. Thank you. Yes, you are, Dr. Rogers. Uh, very well, well, again, a very good morning from uh, Manila. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to be here. It's a pity I could not be there in person. But let me start by acknowledging the senior leadership. Uh, um, His Excellency President Sarangay Rich Jr., uh, Minister Dr. Uwe Bellal, Senator Kwarte, uh, William M. Ibil Reglai, Council of Chiefs, First Lady Valerie Wilkes, Delegate Kanai, 
Vice President Ruth Senior, uh, also my dear WHO colleague Dr. Momoa Takeuchi, uh, other government officials, partners, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be with you at the, at the conference, uh, the 2023 Palau Health Summit. I'll be presenting on redesigning the health systems. If the IT guys can just enable me to share my screen, I'll put the slides up. But meanwhile, let me start by congratulating uh, the, the health leadership and the government leadership for choosing the theme uh, for this year's summit. Uh, clearly, equity is really central and is really at the heart of universal health coverage and the sustainable development. But also the timing is quite appropriate because as we are also now reaching, we are, all right, we are also now reaching the mid of the 2030 agenda on sustainable development goals. And so this is really a, a good time to really take stock. And as we, as countries and, and Palau, recover from the devastating impacts of COVID-19, I think we really need to look at how the health systems are designed, how we can accelerate the progress towards UHC, and how we can improve the health equities. And I'm still not able to share my slides. If someone could kindly assist with sharing our slides. Or would you kindly project from your side? But just to say, let me let me start uh, just speaking through my 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 topic at this point in time. So sustainable development goals really keeps the SDGs at the at the heart of it, and 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 and, and SDGs are really keeping equity at the heart of it. And in fact, two of the of the seventeen goals are related to equity. Health goal, which has the overarching uh, target of universal health coverage, also is really fundamental uh, for equity. But what we've seen over the past two, two and a half years is that COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted essential health services and has widely impacted not only health, but other sectors uh, globally, and as also in the Pacific Island countries, including Palau. Now, I'm still not able to share my slides, and I'm, I'm finding it a bit difficult to present through, but let me just run slides at my end, and I'll speak to them, and please let me know when I'll be able to share my screen. So the vulnerable population has really been disrupted, uh, disproportionately affected uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, and inequities have been exacerbated. So there's a clear sign that not investing in building equitable and resilient health systems for UHC can cost dearly to the economy, society, and, and as well as other sectors. But COVID-19 really wasn't, there was not everything bad about COVID-19 because there were also many lessons that we can take forward. We have seen the whole of systems and whole of government approaches. We have seen rapid innovations and new communication channels and data exchanges established at a very fast pace. We've seen innovative crisis management protocols and care pathways. We also saw how vaccines were developed and new diagnostics were brought in. Many countries, including Palau, have also rapidly managed to train their health staff and also repurpose them, uh, working with the communities and other sectors to minimize and mitigate the impacts of the pandemic. Digital health innovations have been taken up, and telemedicine is, is, has been now really accelerated. The uptake has been accelerated by the COVID-19. But most importantly, there is a huge interest of the people and the communities in the health matter, they now really understand that taking care of health is really critical. But we also need to be cognizant that we will live in a very dynamic health context. 
and therefore there is a need to plan for future. We need agile health systems and policy choices for UHC because we have we see aging population on one side and lifestyle diseases, but also the rise in antimicrobial resistance, emerging pathogens, global migration, climate change, urbanization and industrialization. Health innovations, and then of course, all of this is leading to rising costs. Uh, indeed, people are also asking for more and more care, better care, newer treatments. Uh, to help support the countries move towards UHC, the, the WHO office for Western Pacific Region, uh, working with the member states, have uh, come up with the framework for accelerating progress towards UHC, so which is called UHC Action Framework for Western Pacific. And it talks about really actions or the action domains in all of the six building blocks uh, of, the, of the health systems, starting with governance, health workforce, health financing, essential medicines, medical products, health information systems, and, and quite importantly, service delivery. That's where the rubber hits the road. So there are six key attributes for well-functioning health systems, starting with quality, because without providing quality health services, unless they are effective, they're of no use. We also need efficiencies in the use of health resources and, and, and deployment. Accountability is very key of the government and so we need sort of partnerships and transfer and monitoring and evaluation, but also sustainability and resilience. But equity sits right at the center of the UHC agenda. If we look at the progress made, so let's see where Palau is in progress to UHC, for instance. If we look at the service coverage index or the coverage of essential health service for Palau, it sits at 59, uh, and this is slightly old data. So this is pre-COVID, but this is what is available at the moment. And indeed, there is progress across the Pacific Island countries in the Western Pacific region. But 59 really means that 59% of the population might be having access to the essential health services, whereas a large proportion of the population still does not have access to essential health services for reproductive maternal health, communicable disease, non-communicable disease. And but it might there must be a lot for home care. So the law is doing quite well and and, and we must uh, congratulate the leadership for doing good work and the health workers and the health systems on reproductive maternal and newborn child health and also on communicable disease. But the challenges that we have, we have is on the non-communicable disease. In fact, the coverage of essential services for non-communicable disease has declined over the years uh, if we look at the trends. Let me try again if I'm able to share my screen. Yes, so I'm able to share my screen. Apologies for speaking through, but I think IT has uh, IT has sorted it out. So I was talking about this slide. So on the left, what we see is the Universal Health Coverage Index, which really talks about, you know, index of 14 essential parameters of the service provision and the health services capacity. So we see the service index is coverage of essential health services improving. And, and particularly because of good progress in the maternal and newborn and child health and the communicable disease, but on the non-communicable disease and service capacity, the progress has been has been not as much as we would have wanted. So moving forward, what could be done? How can we redesign health systems for UHC and health equity? Clearly, there is a need for all of the systems approach. I mean, there are four overarching strategic directions that have been agreed, accepted globally, and I'm, I'm sure uh, the, the summit will be talking more about some of these topics in the coming days as well. First thing, and the, and the most important aspect is reorienting health systems toward 
primary health care. That's really critical. Second area is around emergency preparedness and response, but also dealing with the environmental aspects of the emergencies, not only just public health emergencies. The third aspect is around tackling the determinants of health. And lastly, COVID-19, of course, has accelerated the uptake of data, science, and technology, but how can we even do better with that? How can we harness the data, science, and innovation to improve the capacity of the health workforce and data and health information systems? And throughout, we need to focus on the six key attributes of the, you know, of the health systems. Now, for the Western Pacific region, there's a universal health coverage technical advisory group which keeps advising uh, the member states from time to time. And they have really talked about four strategic shifts uh, for transforming the health systems. And indeed, we will need enablers such as political and technical commitment. First and foremost is transforming the health systems and the service delivery platforms. That really talks about strengthening primary health workforce, primary health care, but also health workforce, investing in digital technologies, but also making sure that there is a linkages or there's continuum of care between all levels of care, but also all kinds of providers. The second aspect is around sustainable financing. We know the healthcare costs are rising. Looking at the data, I understand that Palau is already spending more than $1,000 a capita, which is quite high, and these costs are only going to increase with increasing burden of non-communicable disease, you know, emerging technologies, uh, citizens asking for more and newer treatments, but also uncontrolled non-communicable disease can lead to complications. So sustainable financing is, is quite key. And most importantly, you know, improving technical and allocative efficiency. So it's not about more money for health, but also more health for money. So how do we, which areas do we invest in? Which areas give the best value for money? And indeed, of course, we'll have to look at various streams uh, and then flexible streams for financing health uh, from time to time. The third area, the third strategic shift is around strengthening the intersectoral governance. I know the earlier speakers must have talked about how the social determinants of health or other sectors have impact on health and how communities can really, really, uh, community engagement could be really strengthened so that communities know how to take care of their own health. How can we strengthen and build on the COVID experiences for the whole of system and whole of government and whole of society approaches? But also scaling up the accelerators, research, innovations, these are quite critical aspects. Indeed, we need to have monitoring and evaluation for account and accountability, but also looking at the desegregated data, really looking at who is being left behind and why, what are the underlying reasons for that. To start with, we, because we were asked to talk about health systems building blocks, so we will start with service delivery building block, and that's where really health systems come to the fore in delivering services. And that's really the litmus test for the health systems, how well the services are being delivered, how equitable the system is, or is the system able to maintain the continuum of services across the life course, across the levels of care. And so reorienting health systems for primary health care is really critical and, and there is really a foundation for universal health coverage, health equity, but also health security. But we've seen historically that resource allocation really focuses more on curative services, at which cost a lot. And the potential of primary prevention and promotion is, is, is largely, you know, forgotten or not given as importance. But the evidence shows that up to 70% of the disease burden can really be prevented through primary health care. And then PHC, of course, is not new. We've been talking about since Alma Ata or even before, but this requires really a strong emphasis, particularly in the Pacific Island countries. First of all, it meets most health needs of the population, up to 90%, and closer to where population and people live, and in the ways which is more acceptable to the populations. So therefore, it reduces inequities because poor rural remote populations have good access 
availability and acceptability of these services. And this is kind of the first point of contact and they are more likely to use these services. But they also strengthen the community resilience, uh, you know, and early warning systems to deal with disease outbreaks or other emergencies. Some of the specific equity-oriented actions could be that we really tailor the service modalities for the populations who is being served if we are serving in remote islands or we are serving in the areas where people work for long hours, can we, can we maintain opening hours for longer? Or can we find ways or deploy health workforce through outreach workers having culturally appropriate and gender and age specific services? So these are some of the equity oriented actions really looking at people who are being left behind, people who are vulnerable, communities who are vulnerable, how can we best support them through primary health care services? Community engagement is, is really fundamental for the primary health care because it's about co-creating services. It's not about top-down approach of, of what we think are the priorities of the community, but let really community decide or engage with the health systems in deciding what services and what service modalities should be there. It's also very critical to uphold quality because oftentimes we've seen that health services are being provided in very remote areas uh, through health facilities. They are not really well supported. So it's seen sometimes that the poor care for poor people. So we must uphold the quality of primary health care and that's really pivotal. So working with the member states, uh, last year, there was a recent framework on future for primary health care in Western Pacific that was endorsed by all the member states, the health ministers of the member states. And it really outlines five strategic actions for primary health care. First of all, looking at the models of service delivery. Secondly, individual and community empowerment to take care of their own health. Then looking at what kind of workforce cadres do we have, what provider base do we have, and how can we best utilize them, deploy them. Then improving primary health care financing. And lastly, enabling and supportive environment for the primary health care teams and providers. So the big shift that we, we talk about in this recent framework for future of primary health care is moving from episodic care to a more long-term sort of engagement between the communities and the primary health care teams that, that stay with you and provide care and know about you from very early on. And so this, this primary health care framework can really guide the actions to strengthen primary health care, but also tailor according to the needs of Palau and the various islands where the primary health care is being provided. Indeed, it also provides a framework for, for fostering and all of the government action and guiding the investments. Looking at the other country experience, and there are many, I just picked up, we just picked up a few. You know, Brazil's family health strategy, for instance, gave priority to providing primary health care services in the underserved regions and really is a, is a main source of expanding universal health coverage. Thailand has been working a lot on the primary health care. The universal health scheme really requires beneficiaries to register with the primary health care provider and the, and, and the contracting unit for the, as a first line of contact. Turkey's family medicine program does the same. And all of these countries and many more, uh, including many uh, in this region have expanded the coverage of essential health services, which means not only curative services, but also the whole paradigm of the services, preventive, promotive, curative, and rehabilitative services uh, to, to their populations, making progress towards universal health coverage. Now looking at the second and third building blocks, and, and they are in no particular order, but this is how we felt it, it would it flows the best. Let's talk about governance. And, and governance must really focus on reorienting the health policies and strategies for promoting health equity. And, and for that, you always need desegregated data, looking at gender, age, race, you know, geography, or, or any other segregation. We also need to see, and then global experience suggests that administrative barriers must be removed to access to health services. May not be directly relevant to Palau, but some countries do pose a need to 
show an identity card for instance to access health services or, or any other form of administrative barrier. Harmonizing and expanding existing social protection programs is also a good way, really, you know, to respond to the needs of the vulnerable groups uh, and the populations. In terms of health financing, when we are devising a benefit package, we must consider the needs of the worst of. What it really means is the health needs, but also why the most vulnerable people are making catastrophic out-of-pocket expenditures. How can this be prevented? So when we are devising these benefit packages, we must be considering the needs of the worse off. And of course, allocating more resource, resources to primary health care. We have also looked at various models where providers and individuals are actually incentivized for following the health and well-being approaches. And this has been found as a good practice uh, across many, many countries. And these two, again, moving from third and fourth uh, building block, uh, a fit for purpose workforce and, and access to essential medicines are also quite critical. Many countries are now reviewing and updating the policies on health workforce based on health labor market analysis, which really tells you what the epidemiology is looking like, how can we look into the future, what mix of health workforce do we need, how do we produce this health workforce, how do we retain, deploy, and upskill this workforce. So longer term planning is really critical, particularly for a smaller country like Palau. We can also look at incentives to retain health workforce in remote areas. I understand there are more than 300 islands. So how do we, can we, can we ensure that health workforce can be deployed to these areas? But also health workforce really has come up as a central point that we saw during the, during the COVID-19 pandemic, and they were the biggest front. So a lot of focus needs to be on them because also a large chunk of health resources is also spent on health workforce. Global evidence suggests up to 60% of all health resources go for health workforce. So really investing in health workforce for future is critical, including skills upgradation, task shifting, but also human skills, not only just how to treat people, but how to really work with people, work with the communities. And, and of course, you can look at models which are more pertinent to, to Palau, for instance, increasing the annual uptake of sponsored course students through the Pacific Open Learning Health Network, but also perhaps look at strengthening the outreach and the community health worker program. You must be aware there are many, many successful models not only in the lower middle income countries, but also in upper middle income countries. We know the village health volunteers in Thailand or the Barangaya health workers in Philippines, where I am at the moment. Indonesia uses Kadez and, and Kenya uses community health volunteers. India has more than a million ASHA workers, which come from the villages and the communities where they serve. But one critical lesson that we've seen across the world is that these health workers or community health workers need to be supported. They need to be integrated into the primary health care team. They really need tools and hand-holding and supportive supervision and regular support to work effectively in those communities and with dignity in these communities. In terms of essential medicine, of course, we come from a region where traditional medicine is, is, is quite, quite popular. So, we, we, we can look at, and, and eventually the idea is, how do you reduce the costs of, of healthcare and, and, and health systems? And how do you make sure that access is possible while ensuring the quality uh, of the medicines and medical products? So genetics is another option to improve financial access and sustainability. Uh, indeed, uh, another good practice is health uh, intervention technology assessment to make sure that when you are including a new drug or a new treatment into your benefit package, it's well evaluated against the other options and cost effectiveness analysis is, is taken into consideration, particularly looking at the, the non-communicable disease. And uh, many countries and examples from European Union, the smaller countries particularly because they only purchase in smaller quantities, do not have this bargaining power or negotiating power with the big pharma and the pharma companies. 
the many countries have come together and used this pool purchasing mechanism or syndicated purchasing mechanism, as we say, whereby multiple countries come together and, and put their orders for drugs and essential medicines and medical products together. And it has seemed to work quite well uh, in other countries. But also ensuring for the equities perspective that the drugs and medical supply for the remote and worse populations are always available looking at online stock monitoring systems or supply chain management systems, but also finding innovative ways of making sure that drugs are delivered uh, to the remote populations using NGOs or partners. Now, looking at the other building blocks, health information is quite critical and cannot be emphasized more. But I would like to say all of these, these possible many of options have to be contextualized not all will be relevant to you, but you can always use it according to the context, capacity, and the local resources. But we also need to be learning systems. So we learn by doing, and then we must learn from our, our experiences as, as we get along. So there must be strong focus on ongoing monitoring and evaluation. But first of all, the health information systems uh, I mean, we all understood that they are really quite central to decision making, not only during COVID, but we have known it through and through. And many countries are now using the SDG3 monitoring framework, at least, or broader SDG monitoring framework to monitor progress, not only towards the sustainable development goals, but also looking at the disaggregated data and also looking who is being left behind and where they should focus their resources. There is also a WHO health equity assessment tool, which is also called WHO HEAT, which could also be used to look deeper into who is being left behind and why. Uh, indeed, there is also a need to implement ongoing health systems, operational community-based research, really to look at you know, how, what are the gaps and how we can improve access to health services, how can we improve healthy behaviors. And, and, and promote well-being. And all of this data should feed into policies because all data collected but not used is, is kind of inefficient and wasteful. Therefore, and, 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 and of course, if, if policies are also not evidence-informed, then the expenditures that we'll make would be also wasteful. Therefore, data should be informing not only health sector policies, but also non-health sector policies because we see that health is always actually at the receiving end uh, of the, the impact of the policies from other sectors as well. So evidence is quite critical. Now coming to the digital health solutions, this COVID pandemic has really accelerated the uptake of digital technologies. We saw telemedicine, health worker trainings, self-care management, follow-ups, healthy behavior promotion, you know, and a lot more contact tracing, you know, data exchanges, etc. But there are, and, and we need to scale it up because digital health is here to stay. Uh, and health sector has somehow been slow in uptake of digital health, particularly the public health sector. But this is the future. Although we need to consider a few factors, for instance, what is the digital infrastructure or the access to internet in the country? What are the HR capacities? Uh, what are, can digital health or telemedicine provide high standards of care? And, and what happens to those who do not have access or knowledge to digital services or internet? Will they be further left behind? So all of these factors need to be, we need to be thought through, but also looking at data privacy and security. But there are quite a few examples and, and from far away or, or nearby countries. Uh, for instance, this is a slightly uh, old study, but was quite effective and just as for illustrative purposes, uh, and diabetes participant journey. So it was trialed in several countries, Senegal, India, and, and Egypt uh, feature here. So a health worker who really need to support the patients, prevent and manage diabetes on the top, uh, and rolls onto the, the, this, this platforms. He receives regular support on diabetes evaluation, diagnosis management, and patient education. And, and, and that's how the health workers become more effective in recognizing and then treating patients 
of diabetes, but also identifying pre-diabetes patients. Similarly, a pre-diabetic person can enroll and receive uh, messages based on criteria such as age, gender, pregnancy status, risk factors, etc. And, 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 and through this kind of health promoter promotion activities using digital health technologies, the individual is able to is advised to make small changes and is able to make changes to reduce risk factor for diabetes, for instance, better diet or exercise or, or, or any other factors. And, and this prevents really onset of diabetes and, 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 and similar applies to the diabetes patients. Uh, and tobacco cessation was also uh, one of the you know initiatives that that WHO tried together with the ITU, which is the International Telecommunications Union, whereby the people who want to quit tobacco are supported uh, through messaging services and calls and digital health platforms, and then support is provided constantly uh, till the time they, they they quit. And 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 these interventions have also yielded quite a few results. For instance, a look, and there were a lot, around 11 countries, 15 different programs, and more than 3 million beneficiaries. For instance, the India has sent tobacco secession, 19% self-reported a quit rate among the sample of the program users, which is, which is fairly high. Uh, for diabetes, for instance, you know, there was an increase amongst the subscriber following healthy diets and advice, practicing physical activities. Similar applies across you know, Senegal, Egypt, and other countries. And Zambia, which had uh, a program on M survival, cervical cancer, the results show that 6% increase in survival, cervical cancer screenings that that patient, that people access attributable to the, uh, to the program in this problem. So, so solutions are there, they need to be just contextualized uh, and, 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 and then sort of implemented. Last but not the least, uh, and then this links to health systems, but also goes beyond health systems because intersectional governance and community engagement is quite critical. Whole of system and whole of government approaches and whole of society approaches are very, very vital. The, for instance, the essential public health functions are one of the most cost effective and comprehensive and sustainable way to enhance health of populations and individuals. People-centered integrated health services and engaging people and empowering people to adopt healthy lifestyle, but also looking at health and all policies and, 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 and really working with the sectors that have impact on health can make major changes. But indeed, there are many, many uh, different actions that can be taken in this domain also. Developing different strategies for NCD prevention, for populations of different ethnic backgrounds, but also for different geographies, for instance. Promoting the concept of healthy island, you have been doing it uh, for long, and we continue to do that. Health education and media campaigns targeting vulnerable groups. Capacitating, really, because health is not made in hospitals, but in, in places where people live, work, and grow, individuals and communities are capacitated to really take care of their own health but also know when and where to go if they really require some health services at the hospital or primary health care level. The WHO Framework Convention for Tobacco Control, you know, and its implementation. And I would like to congratulate uh, uh, the government uh, for bringing in executive orders and, and, and calling NCDs and emergencies, which has led to several of, of these actions uh, within Palau, but also there is scope for improvement because NCDs seem to be on rise and the coverage of essential services for non-communicable disease seems to be one of the biggest challenges. Uh, let me now just close with this summary messages. To start with, the Pacific Island countries, including Palau, need to invest in building fair health systems. Health systems that promote health equity, and that it also are able to respond to evolving population needs consistently delivering good quality of care to improve health for all. While UHC is a, is a, is a goal for all the countries, but UHC cannot be achieved or sustainable development cannot be achieved without health equity. Healthy people and healthy nations only contribute to moving economies, have happy societies, and well-being. 
So there is a need to remove chronic barriers to health access and promote health systems which are primary healthcare oriented. And clearly this point cannot be hammered enough without data, research, evidence. You cannot guide effective policies and investments. Therefore, standardized and disaggregated data and at national and sub-national level is really fundamental and almost a starting point for any policy dialogue. As we say, there are three Ds, data, dialogue, and decisions. And we, I mean, there is a wealth of knowledge out there. You can look at these country experiences, but this is just a tip of iceberg. There are many, many good practices. So knowledge is out there. What we need is innovative approaches and ongoing monitoring, learning, and evaluation. And indeed, everything has to be driven by the context, capacity, and resources. So specific implementations plan could be done. There could be UHC roadmap implementation, which could be monitored, which could be context specific, and which could be monitored through and through and tweaked as we get along. But most critical is government stewardship. And I, I would again praise uh, and congratulate the government stewardship for organizing this health summit at this critical juncture uh, in, in terms of health and health equity. So stewardship is a must for stakeholder and community engagement, partnerships, and smart investments in health workforce and health systems development because equity cannot wait. Time is to act now, and the progress will not happen overnight, we all know, but small steps in the right direction with the right people will lead to universal health coverage and health for all. I would like to thank you, but would also like to acknowledge my, my colleagues who have supported me uh, put together some of this presentation. And again, uh, I think there were some glitches in the beginning, but I think we went through quite well. I would like to stop here, and I would like to thank you very much. We remain available uh, to Palau government, Ministry of Health, uh, to provide any support needed further. Thank you very much. Dr. Rajesh Nawal is the uh, 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 coordinator for the universal health coverage with WHO. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the morning's uh, sessions for the summit for day one. Uh, lunch is being served. Uh, we do ask the public uh, to go get food first and then followed by the students, whoever stu whichever students are here. And then we kindly ask the MHHS staff to to eat after our guests have eaten. Uh, hold on. Since we are hosting the summit. Okay. It's I've just been told it's uh, since it's raining outside, you can bring uh, uh, your food uh, inside here and eat your lunch. Okay. Just a reminder again, the breakout sessions are between one one p.m. and uh, 3 p.m. Please make sh make your way back here uh, to the gym uh, by 3 o'clock. We do have a planned activity before our afternoon pl plenary sessions, which begins at 3.30. Thank you, everyone.
virtually uh, presented to us by Jason Ligo. Uh, he's the mental health promotion and communication consultant with WHO Western Pacific Regional Office. Let, uh, we're just gonna set it up and then we begin the session. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon everyone from Manila. My name is Dr. Jason Digot from WHO. I work at the Mental Health and Substance Use Unit. It is my pleasure to be with you virtually this afternoon. I wish I could be there in person. I've been to Palau a few times. It's such a beautiful country with such warm people. Maybe next time, but uh, because of Zoom and all of these virtual tools, at least we're still able to carry out this breakout session together. Now, uh, I'd like to thank all of you for attending this breakout session. We'll be talking about a very, very important topic, which is mental health and suicide prevention. So let's get started with our session right now. And I understand that my colleague James will be helping facilitate this session for us. So thank you so much, James, for, uh, <laughs> for, for facilitating the session. Unfortunately, I can't see the people in the room, so I, I'm, I'm hoping you guys are settled in and are ready to get started with our session today. It will be interactive, so there will be a part of the session where we will ask you to, to think about suicide prevention in your own communities and how we can really come together to support young people and prevent suicide. So James, I just want to double check uh, if you're seeing my screen right now before I start with the presentation proper. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so again, my name is Dr. Jason Ligot. I work at the WHO Regional Office for the Western Pacific. On behalf of the WHO, we'd like to thank the government of Palau for inviting us uh, to this very important health summit. A couple of my colleagues, as you may be aware, in the reading through the program, will be talking about different topics over the next four days. And we really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and to engage in dialogue regarding all of these important public health topics. So as I mentioned earlier, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about mental health and well-being just to make sure that we're all on the same page and we have a shared understanding of some concepts before we start with our community activity. I'll also be sharing some data, some strategies and approaches regarding preventing suicide, excuse me, really highlighting the fact that as a community, there is a role that all of us can do in preventing this very, um, this important issue. Um, and then we'll proceed with a community mapping activity. Now that's very exciting because here we will work together as one group during this next hour to really think through the problem of suicide and how we can start getting our ourselves organized, where do we start, what are the different factors that we should consider in making up a plan or an approach to prevent suicide. And at the very end of the session, I'm going to rely on my colleague James again to do some feedback and processing. This is very important for us because, you know, suicide, yes, it really does have a, a big impact on the people that are around, that are close to that person who commits suicide, but really it's a, it's a community issue. We all have a role in preventing it, and we all have a role in definitely in promoting mental health and well-being for everyone. Okay, so let's get started with mental health and well-being. Now, I've been talking about this issue for many years now. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a topic of interest, but also my specialty. And whenever I am, I'm asked to talk about mental health, I always go back to these two classic definitions from the WHO. And the first is from way back in 1946. And according to the WHO Constitution, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease and infirmity. Now, for those of you who studied medicine or public health or are studying public health, this definition might be familiar to you. You may have encountered it in your textbooks or your lectures. But for the rest of the group who is maybe hearing about this for the first time, I, I really think this definition of health way back in 1946 is very wise because it highlights that, you know, not just because you don't have a diagnosis or you don't, don't fall within certain criteria to, to say that you're suffering from a particular condition, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're healthy. 
In fact, what this definition says is that it's complete physical, mental, and social well-being. So it's not just the physical health that matters, but also our mental health, which is our topic today. And also our social health and well-being, which refers to the relationships that we have with other people, our family, our friends, our colleagues, and the community at large. All of that has a role in making sure that we ourselves are fully healthy and well. Now, when it comes to mental health, we want to highlight that actually, you know, good mental health is the foundation of well-being. Why? Because when we have good mental health, we are enabled to realize our full potential. We're able to apply our talents, our skills, our interests. And that really speaks to about our capacity to determine our future. What do we want to do with our lives? How do we want to spend our time? What do we want to do? What do we want to spend our energy making? At the same time, it also uh, empowers us to be resilient amid adversity. And I think the past three years has really been a such a universal human experience, hasn't it, with the pandemic. The pandemic is a shared experience. As I'm sure at some point or other, we've all felt the same fear or anxiety, or if somebody you know um, got infected with COVID-19 or maybe even passed away from it, I think we can all share in that human experience in the sorrow that um, and the stress that that caused. But what the, the pandemic has also taught us is really the importance of mental health in making sure that we are resilient despite all of these adversities. And that's really the reality of life, isn't it? We have to accept that stress will come, adversity will come, and good mental health will enable us to face all of these troubles head on and emerge even better for it. It's also about productivity, and this is being productive across the various settings of daily life. Definitely for most of us, that refers to being productive at work or at school, but it also means being productive in your family setting or your home setting, being able to do chores, um, help around in the house, or just relate with your family members. Productivity is really how we apply ourselves, our energy into, into things that matter, to tasks that we have to do every day and good mental health is crucial for us to be productive across the many settings of life that we find ourselves in and finally when we speak about mental health we're not just talking about individuals it is really really about the community and this is something that we've been highlighting with our new regional framework for the ment uh, for the future of mental health and it's about forming meaningful relationships while making a contribution to the people around us and this is again important to highlight in the context of the pandemic because yes while we've seen so much um, distress so much suffering because of the pandemic it has also shown just wonderful examples of communities coming together families neighbors etc just helping each other get through a very difficult time <clears throat> and again that points uh, to the why mental health is really the foundation of well-being and going back to that classic definition of health, which is complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease and infirmity. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, the other thing I would like to highlight when it comes to mental health is that, you know, our mental health is important throughout our entire lifespan. And at every point in life, there are various factors or, uh, or things that can either help our mental health or pull us down. And that starts from even before we're born, you know, being born to healthy parents versus being born an unwanted pregnancy, the kind of care that mothers receive, the kind of parenting that we receive that we provide to our children, the kinds of experiences that we, uh, we, 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 we get through school, the skills that we build, not just the knowledge that we earn, but the life skills that we build and that we hone in school that will enable us to participate fully in, in society afterwards. The kind of peer group that we, that we pursue you know, when we're younger, the kinds of uh, uh, experiences that we're able to, um, to engage in, meaningful work for sure, healthy relationships, social security and support, uh, especially during late adulthood and old age. All of these factors can help protect and promote our mental health. However, at the same time, um, as I said, uh, poor pregnancies, inadequate care, poor parenting, maybe some behavioral problems, problems at school, with peers, uh, risk-taking definitely, substance misuse, unemployment, substance abuse, which includes alcohol and drugs, 
even loneliness, chronic illness, financial insecurity, all of these factors can pull us down, can have a negative impact on mental health. Now, the, I think the thing to consider here is that, as I said, mental health is important throughout the lifespan. In other words, when we talk about promoting mental health, we're not just talking about helping those who may be clinically depressed or anxious or suffering from a psychotic disorder. Certainly, they deserve a specific kind of help. They need access to services, medication for some, therapy for others. But all of us have mental health needs, and those needs don't stop at a certain age. They, those needs are actually constant throughout life, and it's important for us as a community to keep that in mind. That everybody has mental health needs, and there, everyone has. Uh, there are different ways, rather, that we can promote and protect mental health as we go through life. Now, I'll zoom in a little bit on suicide, which is the which is really the focus of our session today. Because later on, when we do the community mapping activity, we'll be thinking about some important questions as a community on why this happens and how we can prevent it. It goes without saying that suicide is a major public health issue. According to the latest data from the WHO, over 700,000 people die from suicide every year. And it's actually the fourth leading cause of death among young people aged 15 to 19. As you can see from this graph, there really is a peak that starts sometime between middle to late adolescence and continues on to young adulthood during your 20s or 30s. So this is really a high-risk group for suicide, which is why uh, many suicide prevention strategies focus on this particular group. Now, evidence has shown that uh, across the Pacific, young people and ethnic minorities are particularly at risk. The most common means of uh, performing suicide is through self-poisoning, suffocation, or hanging. There are many different factors that might influence or that might explain why this is a particular issue among young people. Uh, a lot of the research literature points out to really the changing context that young people find themselves today with social media, peer pressure, and all of those different pressures that come from outside that can be very difficult for young people to navigate. Also, the nature of families are changing, traditional customs, social structures that used to be there that help keep people resilient or mentally well before. Some of those are changing, and all of these changes can be very overwhelming for young people. At the same time, um, young people also face challenges in accessing services. So even if they wanted to, either the service is not there or they're not friendly enough to adolescents so they feel intimidated to engage with health services when they need them the most. So, which is why, again, uh, young people are an important uh, population when it comes to suicide prevention. Now, in Palau, according to the hybrid survey that was published in 2017, the suicide rate was about 21.7 um, per 100,000, which is about twice the global average. That's very, very high. And I, again, I appreciate the focus of this summit on mental health. This is not the only session on mental health, as you may appreciate in the program. And I appreciate the government's um, focus and highlight on mental health because it, there are really many different aspects to mental health, and this is only one of them. But what this data shows is that uh, across both sexes, both men and women, from the 15 to 19-year-old age group, suicide is really one of the top four leading causes of death. Among females, it's actually the top third. Um, it's the top three cause of death. So it's really quite alarming how many young people are are facing or experiencing mental distress to the extent that they may consider harming themselves or even committing suicide. Now, the WHO published Live Life, which is really a framework that we like to advocate uh, to countries, to governments, but also to communities as an approach to preventing suicide. And the key to the Live Life framework is, one, it has to be strategic, definitely. It also needs to be multi-sectoral. And I'd like to highlight this message, and I'll, I'll highlight this again later on. While we're very concerned about young people um, and the, the stresses that they face on a day-to-day -day and all of the mental pressures that they may be going through, I'd like to highlight that young people themselves are actually our greatest asset in promoting and protecting their mental health. So I hope that there are young people joining us here in the room because you, you guys are really our greatest asset and we would love to work with you in making sure that you yourselves determine what is the best way of promoting and protecting your mental health.
Now, there are different components to live life. We don't have enough time to go through the details, but I'd just like to highlight that. One, as I said, it's strategic, so it's always good to start with the situational analysis. And the community mapping activity that we will do today is really part of, of that situational analysis. And then it requires multi-sectoral collaboration. Suicide is not just an issue for the school or the health system. It's an issue for the community at large. So if you're part, if you're here in this room and you're interested, thank you so much for your interest. And I hope that you can sustain this interest even after this breakout session. Definitely, there's an aspect of raising awareness. People need to know what are the different signs that may point to increased suicide risk. There's an there's a element of building capacity, so we all have to strengthen our skills. There's an element of money also. Um, good suicide prevention strategies require resources, manpower. And finally, surveillance, monitoring, and evaluation, which really provides the backbone of any good public health program. Now, the life part refers to four key evidence-based interventions that we would like to promote when it comes to suicide prevention. So L refers to limiting access to means of suicide and the community mapping activity. We'll talk a little bit about that too. I refers to interacting with the media on responsible reporting for suicide. We know that whenever a suicide is reported in a sensational manner, not very responsible manner by the media, that actually causes mental distress for other people and could potentially lead other people to harm themselves or even uh, attempt to commit suicide themselves. For young people, what, we, what we'd like to highlight is really about fostering life skills, which I also talked about earlier. And when we refer to life skills, it's about being able to solve problems, to seek help when you need it, to find support not just in, with your peers, but also with your family, with other members in the community, and know how to take care of yourselves. All of these are very fundamental skills that we need to build among young people so that they can be resilient no matter what life throws at them. And definitely early identification and support for those particular individuals who may be especially at risk for suicide. Now, this is a uh, kind of like a mapping that was done on different interventions. Some of them are universal, some of them are selective, and others are indicated to address all of these different risk factors that may heighten the risk of suicide. So I, I won't go through all of them. I just want to highlight before, so, so that we can get into the activity right away that when it comes to preventing suicide among young people, as I said, yes, it's about fostering social emotional life skills among adolescents so that they're, they're capable of uh, themselves withstanding whatever stress comes their way. Definitely, we want to train the staff in the education. The school setting is such an important setting for preventing suicide, especially among young people. We want to make sure that that environment, that school environment is safe. So anti-bullying programs, for example, are interventions to ensure that the safe is safe, that the school is a safe and nurturing environment for young people. We want to link to support services so that young people don't feel intimidated to ask for help and that they can receive help, particularly when they need it, when they're feeling emotionally overwhelmed or in distress. There needs to be clear policies and protocols, of course, for staff when suicide risk is identified. We don't want to perpetuate negative stereotypes or stigma. Instead, we want people to have a positive view of mental health in general and to know and be aware of uh, simple steps that they can do if they, f if they find a student, for example, or a young person is at risk of her harming himself or herself. And the parents, of course, are key partners here. So we need to educate our parents. So I hope that there are also parents here listening to this breakout session because you are a key partner in this effort to prevent suicide among young people. Okay, so I'm going to stop there and I'm now going to turn it over to James for our community mapping activity. So what we're going to do here is that as a group, we're going to go through a series of questions. Now, James, you have to let me know. I don't know how many people are in the room, but if it's a big group, my suggestion would be for you to break out into smaller groups to do the mapping activity. So what's a small group? Maybe somewhere between six to eight people or maybe even a little less so that you know there's enough time for everyone to, to speak their mind, to provide their output. Um, once you form a group, I suggest you appoint a facilitator who will just go through the questions, keep time, and make sure that everybody has a, has a chance you know, to, to speak and to share their thoughts and their insights. And somebody to take down notes because all of these inputs hopefully will be 
forwarded and will be captured by the ministry so that they can inform actual policies or interventions. And then answer the guide questions. And then later on, as a group, uh, we will uh, select one or two insights to share during feedback. So my colleague has said there are around 20 people there, so that's maybe good for about maybe four groups. Um, and I think that will be great for you to just, you know, as a small group, to think through these questions. Now, obviously, there are no right or wrong answers here. And the idea here is that for us as a community, to take a step back and really go through these guide questions that were developed specifically for this community mapping activity. So what are the guide questions? There are only three. One, as far as you know, if you don't know, that's, that's totally fine. Where are locations with ready access to means of suicide? And but what I mean by that is, for example, maybe areas that are unsafe, high buildings, bridges, uh, areas where people can easily uh, acquire means of harming themselves, whether it's uh, sharp objects or um, uh, solvents, liquids that are dangerous, maybe even firearms. Um, all of these mapping. Now, I know that the topic can seem a little heavy to think about, but it's really just talking about it openly and being very candid about, you know, where, where are people harming themselves or potentially harming themselves that we can have a genuine conversation about this important issue. The next question is, again, as far as you know, what programs or services for suicide prevention are present in our community? And this can cover a wide range of programs or services that could include, for example, training programs assessment and follow-up programs. So these are more health services, but also education and awareness campaigns, youth counseling, etc. Just list down as many as, you, as you're aware of, even if you're not entirely sure that it's a suicide prevention program per se, but if you feel that this is something that could benefit young people's mental health and help prevent suicide, let's list them down. The idea here is that as a group, we will populate this list and we'll, we'll have kind of a picture of what uh, what is available to the community right now so that we can also understand what are the gaps that need to be filled later on. And last but very important, and again, I hope that there are young people in the room. If they're not, that's, that's also okay. We were all young ones. How can we engage young people in suicide prevention activities? Because, you know, as WHO, we f do feel that it is uh, so crucial that we engage young people in these activities, engage in, and talk with them in this conversation because ultimately uh, they are, as I said, our greatest asset in promoting and protecting their mental health. Okay, so I'm just checking my watch for the time. We'll have about 25 minutes for this activity. I'm going to ask James now just to let me know if there are any questions in the room mm -hmm. or any of the instructions are unclear. So James, um, so far how are we doing? Um, can you hear me okay? Doc? Hello? Can you hear? Okay. Yep, yep I can okay. hear you. Hi. So we have actually about 70 folks in the room. So we're going to wow, try that's and. That's a big number. Uh, yeah, it's a big number. So we're going to try and break them up in groups of 8 to 10 right now. And um, okay. maybe have uh, about 15 to 20 minutes of discussion so there's enough time for this uh, session to have them share some feedback. Is that okay? Okay, wonderful. Yep, that's fine. And no pressure. I know it's a, we only have an hour and we're trying to do a lot. So don't feel that you have to answer like thoroughly. Just go through the questions. What's important is we have this conversation right now. And as much as possible, everyone in the group gets an opportunity to speak his or her mind. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, leave this, these questions up on the screen. James will help sort you out and group you. And then I'll, I'll come in periodically just to check on in the time. And then later on during feedback, I really hope that some of you can, you know, speak up and share your insights. We'll have a, a new set of questions there. I'll also play a little light music if you don't mind. I always feel it helps to kind of set the mood so people kind of can really get into the activity. But uh, it won't be too loud. So uh, I'll get into that. So again, thank you so much, James, for helping facilitate this session. And thank you to all of you. Uh, wow, that's a, that's a big number uh, for your interest in this issue. We'll see you in a bit. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. So uh, in line with the activity, if it would be possible, if you can group yourselves around 8 to 10 people, you don't have to move far, just those who are in your area. Uh, group yourself in around 8 to 10 people. And uh, the questions will come back on the screen. 
uh, please elect somebody in your group to take the notes for the group and uh, that person will also share out when it's time for the share out portion Again, please gather yourselves in groups of eight to ten people, small groups. And the guide questions for the discussion will are up here on the screen. If you have any questions, please raise your hand and we'll come and assist you as needed.
check in with James. I, I'm actually going to leave it to to the group. If you want to extend the session, that's totally fine with me. My afternoon is dedicated for this session. But if we need to to end on time on the dot, then uh, we'll end on time on the dot too. So we have about 10 minutes left. I hope you're really getting into the discussion and going through the different guide questions. Thank you.
time to accommodate for the next groups that are coming in for the next session. So maybe with the time that we have, if there are a few groups that would like to share uh, one or two of their, their comments, uh, we can go ahead and have that for now. And then what we'll do is we'll take the responses from your small groups and type them out for distribution later on in this week, if that's OK for everybody. I know it's a very interesting topic, and we want more time, but um, we're very limited. So. All right. So thank you so much, James. And uh, James was actually letting me know that the discussions in the small groups have been very engaging and animated. So thank you so much for your interest in this topic. There will be an opportunity to follow up, I'm sure. And as, you know, as I've been repeating in this session, it really is a community effort. So because of the pressure to just keep to the time, and we totally understand that there are other very important sessions and topics also that may need the room, we'll move ahead with the group uh, processing and feedback. Now, for this session, we also prepared some guide questions for, for each of you, for anyone who actually would like to share. Uh, and as James mentioned, we will try to capture all of your inputs uh, from this session so that they can be taken forward. So the floor is open. Basically, we'd like to hear from you after hearing briefly from each other. What are, what do you think is the, so what is the sentiment towards suicide in Palau to begin with? What are the attitudes that we have to, um, that we have to either address or that we can encourage, depending whether they're helpful or not. Uh, after doing the mapping that you did, uh, what are the current gaps in services and infrastructure that you reckon um, in, that are currently that that became evident in Palau, and how you know what are these things that need to be addressed? And then finally, how can we work as one community, especially with young people, to promote mental health and prevent suicide? So if anyone is free to, sh to share their insights, I'd, I'd love to hear them. I wish I was there with you, but uh, I guess this will have to do for now. So anyone who would like to share. Hello. Hello. So. I'll just report on the, the first one. The first uh, question was where are locations? Mm -hmm. And the written here is uh, inside the room, rooms, uh, tree okay. next to the house, uh, correction facility, and then mm -hmm. forest, um, there's a lady from Japan, so there's train stations, and then right. somebody mentioned ocean programs uh, it says here there's not much prevention mm. programs in palau usually when it happens then everybody talk about it and then right. it right. then it dies down <coughs> how to engage young people in suicide prevention um, somebody mentioned the, a center maybe a facility where parents and youth can have uh, trainings or basically understanding how a person is suicidal and how we can help. Mm -hmm. So those were the... Okay, thank you so much. I think that was very, very helpful and insightful. Definitely the family environment or the home setting is an important setting for suicide prevention. I think that came out very clearly in your discussion. Uh, and I understand that sometimes it, it may, yeah, the, the lack of programs can be quite discouraging. but. The, the important thing to take away from this community mapping exercise is that at least now we know what services are available or are not available. And then from there, we can start to prioritize and how we can build up services and where to invest. And yes, definitely having a place where parents, young people can have these discussions, very important. So thank you so much to your group for sharing those wonderful outputs. Me, I think we have time for maybe two more. Yes, we have another okay. one up. Very good. Ali? Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm just going to read our answers for the question one, then two, and three. Yeah? So for the first one, uh, our answer is too many trees and abandoned houses with mm. the opportun opportunities and means to do self-harm, including the bottom of the ocean. Uh, also, with that, uh, we we answered with uh, isolation at home, 
It can be mm -hmm. mental, emotional, or physical isolation. Right. The second question uh, we answered, uh, there's really not really uh, good uh, education and awareness to the public. And the third one, we answered with, uh, we can solicit uh, youth groups uh, and select a core group uh, for mm -hmm. so that they can do education and awareness to help the community, so that the community can enjoy a healthy life. Uh, everyone should be involved. Uh, and one of the things that we suggested was to incorporate uh, mental health uh, into the family planning clinics, uh, the prenatal clinics, and the well baby clinics. Thank you. Thank you. I think those are really excellent suggestions, especially the integration with other services. Uh, as we, as I mentioned in my, my slides earlier, there are mental health needs at every stage of life, meaning to say, you know, whatever state or whatever age you're in, there is an opportunity for us to, to talk about mental health, to have that conversation. So I think those are really excellent suggestions. And definitely awareness raising and education, as I mentioned in the Live Life Framework, that's one of the pillars, the foundations of a good suicide prevention strategy is to have these dialogues. So uh, thank you for, for coming to this breakout session. I hope that you can, you can have these conversations in your workplaces, schools, your own communities, because really that's where it starts when we start talking about this issue um, uh, together, that we can start thinking about solutions. So, um, is there anyone else who would like to share? Okay. Yeah, we have. Uh, uh, unfortunately, this will have to be the last one uh, so that we can keep to the time. But thank you so much to those who volunteered to speak up. The first question, where are locations with ready access to means of suicide? Um, similarly, things are among with the first group that went. Uh, uh, homes uh, around the households, internet access, mm -hmm. uh, the means of internet access, and they get ideas on how to be creative in, in terms of being suicidal. And then mm -hmm. some which are rare is drowning. Uh, second question was uh, what programs and services. Uh, we listed down... Um, existing services within Palau. So we have uh, behavioral health, uh, school health, mm -hmm. uh, risk assessment, uh, state and private youth NGOs, uh, uh, collaborative efforts with faith-based or community services. Church and counselors are, are outlets where mm -hmm. they can find help if they, if they need um, um, to deal with uh, depression and anxiety. Um, as far as for the third question, how can we engage young people in suicide prevention activities. Um, mm -hmm. We went with community awareness, teach and train the community in dealing with stress and depression, and community education, training in identifying signs and helping them, the potential victims or somewhat in, in, in the patterns of becoming suicidal. Um, parental education as well, and focus groups. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Let me just pick up on two points that you mentioned. And thank you so much to the group for the very um, meaningful output. One, I think it's good to highlight that there are services that are available. So it's good that you mentioned a couple of different services because maybe some people in the room might not be aware that there are programs being offered by the Behavioral Health Unit. And one thing you mentioned is the important role of counselors or spiritual leaders in providing support for young people. Actually, not just for young people, but for people in general. Um, and it really points to the importance of you know, different members of the community coming together, being there, being present to provide support. Uh, one of the most common questions I get asked, actually, is, you know, doctor, what do I say to someone who's going through a difficult time emotionally? And the answer to that question is actually, you know, many times it's, not, it's less about what what we should be saying or what we should say, but it's um, more about how we should listen. And definitely, all of us have that capacity to be a trusted person that people can, can confide in, they can share their feelings and their emotions. So thank you so much for that. Very important to highlight. 
Now, unfortunately, we come to the end of the session, and just like to end with this picture. So, a couple of months ago, I had an opportunity to visit Palau to talk about this issue as well during the Palau Women's Conference. And after that, I had an opportunity to, to go to one of the schools in Palau. I think this was the Palau Mission Academy. And to have a kind of like just an informal session with young people. And this was the photograph that we took at the end of the session. And I'm sharing this with all of you now just to say again that, you know, let's talk to young people. If there are young people in the room. I know there are a lot of people there. Um, please have this conversation. Talk to someone you trust if you're going through a difficult time, but also be involved in your community. As you can see from the interest here, I think we're all invested in making sure that your mental health and well-being is promoted and protected. And young people have so many wonderful ideas. I post similar questions to them, asking them, you know, what do you do when you're having a bad day? How do you support a friend who's going through a difficult time? And they just had the most practical, sensible, and just wonderful ideas of doing that. So let's have these conversations with young people and make sure that they're involved from the beginning of any suicide prevention strategy up until its implementation, even during monitoring and evaluation. You'd be surprised at the insights that we can really get from young people themselves. So on that note, I'd like to say thank you so much again for your interest. Uh, wow, the, the hour just flew. <laughs> I wish we had more time. I wish I was there. There are so many things that uh, we, we could have uh, maybe um, another time, but uh, again, I, I gather that there are a lot of people in the room which shows really good interest in this topic. Please continue having these conversations. Um, our organizers and secretariat will collate all your inputs and feed them uh, back into the program. Hopefully, that will also make um, these services more available. So on behalf of the WHO, thank you for joining us for this breakout session on mental health and suicide prevention. My name is Dr. Jason Ligot. Thank you so much for your attention. Person, the next time I'm in Palau. So goodbye for now. Thank you so much. Have a good rest of the summit and afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody who attended this uh, just concluded session. Uh, we're going to be uh, waiting for the other participants to get make their way here. They're from the other venues. Uh, we do have an activity at 3 o'clock, and then the remaining two plenary sessions thereafter. Thank you. Please do not leave.
program. Thank you. So the first prize is a backpack. The winner is five four six seven one one eight. Five four six seven one one eight. Next number is five four six seven two eight seven. Five four six seven two eight seven. The price is backpack. Okay, next number. Next number is five four six seven one seven nine. Five four six seven one seven nine. Taka at okay. <laughs> Next number is five four six six nine eight three. Five four six six nine eight three. Price is a backpack. Taka at okay. Okay, next number is five four six six nine nine zero. Five four six six nine nine zero. Yeah. Okay, moving on to the next number. Uh five four six seven two four one. Five four six seven two four one. Next number is five four six seven zero four nine. Five four six seven zero four nine. Next. Okay. Five four six seven one four one. Price is backpack. Five four six seven one four one. Okay, moving on. Uh, five four six seven two five zero. Five four six seven two five zero. Five four six seven zero three six. No one. Okay, next number. Five four six six nine six seven. Five four six six nine six seven. Okay. Five four six seven zero eight zero. Five four six six nine four seven. Taka up. Okay. Five four six seven zero zero five. <laughs> Almost. All right. Five four six six nine eight one. Five four six six nine eight one. Five four six six nine six nine. Six nine six nine. Next. Five four six seven two eight nine. Seven two eight nine. 
Okay, so the backpack is uh, included with the $20 bill. <laughs> okay, so the next number is 546 okay. 546-7137. 546-7137. 546-7111. Yay! <laughs> Yay! Okay, the next prize uh, is uh, another backpack with a $20 bill. The number is 546-6962. Yeah. Five four six seven zero two five. Yes, give you the winner. <laughs> okay. Two. Two twenty. Okay. So the next price is twenty dollar bill. Uh, the number is five four six seven zero one zero. Five four six seven zero one zero. Okay. Five four six seven zero four three. Seven zero four three. Okay, next, uh, five four six seven one four six seven one four six Yay, congratulations. <laughs> one twenty, okay. So the next price is the same as the last one. It's a twenty dollar bill. Number is five four six seven zero one eight. Seven zero one eight. Okay, next five four six six nine three eight. Six nine three eight. Okay, next five four six seven zero two six. Seven zero two six. Okay. Five four six seven two one zero. Seven two one. Yay! Yay. Yay. The next um, prize is a fifty dollar bill. Okay, the lucky number is 546-7208-7208. Going once. <laughs> okay, 546-7208, nothing. Okay. Okay, 
Okay, five four six seven zero one nine. Seven zero one nine. <laughs> Seven zero one nine. Okay, moving on. Five four six six nine four eight. Six nine four eight. Okay, moving on. Five four six seven two two seven. Yay! And that muta last. Okay, here's the final uh, prize. Oh, not yet. Okay. Fifty dollars. Okay. Okay. Um, second to the last, the prize, fifty dollars. Fifty dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Five four six seven one four seven one five zero. Sorry, seven one five zero. Five four six seven one five zero. Fifty dollars. Yeah. Okay. Five four six seven zero four one. Seven zero four one. Yeah, and get give. Okay, this is the last prize. It's the grand prize uh, for today. It's a uh, tablet Samsung. Okay, the lucky number is five four six seven zero three seven. <laughs> seven zero three seven. Next, next, okay. <laughs> Five, four, six, six, nine, nine, three. Six, nine, nine, three. Yay! Congratulations! Oh, yikes! <laughs> okay. Five four six seven two five four. Seven two five four. Yeah. <laughs> Five four six seven zero eight four. Seven zero eight four. Samsung tablet. Seven zero eight four. Next. Five four six six nine seven eight six nine seven eight. Yay! Oh, can you give it? Okay, okay. That's it for today for the raffle prizes. Okay. Congratulations to all our raffle uh, winners. Uh, at this time, uh, our I'd like to take this opportunity and ask uh, Mr. Jake Fisher from MD Wholesales to come and announce a, I guess, a surprise for us all. Mr. Jake. Yeah. Ali? Well, we decided to add another one for Thursday, our final uh, grand prize. We're going to offer one uh, round-trip ticket to the Philippines or Guam. Okay.
That will be our grand prize. So it's your choice. If you win it, you have a choice of going to Guam and come back or go to the Philippines and come back. Well, we know there's um, a lot of you guys go to the Philippines for medical checkups. So we decided I think that would be a good, um, good offer to you guys or Guam. Okay. So you guys all have to come back on Thursday. Okay. So long, huh? Thank you, Jake and MD Wholesales for that. Yeah, I'd like to ask the folks that are still at the back of the room to please uh, come in so we can start uh, on our uh, next uh, sessions, please. Okay, I guess everybody's here. Okay, it's a quick announcement. There's been a a slight change to the afternoon uh, plenary sessions. Um, we are gonna go ahead and uh, uh, present the one that was supposed to be the second one this afternoon, uh, addressing health equity in NCD prevention and management. Uh, and then after that, we'll, we'll talk about the Omicron situation. Okay, so Martin Taylor is the director of the v Division of Health Systems and Services with the WHO Western Pacific Regional Office. He will be join on, joining us virtually to give us a talk on addressing health equity and NCD prevention and management. Thank you. Oh, sorry, hold on. So the next presenter is trying to connect with us. So in the meantime, while we wait for that to happen, uh, can we do another raffle? Huh? So maybe not a raffle yet, but I... Uh, here are the prices for the ruffles tomorrow. So we have five backpacks, uh, one JBL mini speaker. We have five $20 bills to give away, another $50, and one and another Samsung tablet. This is for tomorrow, tomorrow's ruffles. Okay, thank you, MD. And Thursday. One Thursday. Oh, there's another one for Thursday as well. Okay, so. We have bags with calculators and tape dispensers. We have five $20 bills again, another $50 bill, another, and then there's a $100 bill. One, is that doorbell? Yeah. One doorbell camera, uh, one Canon pr printer. Yes, and then of course the round trip to get to either Guam or the Philippines on Thursday. Thank you, MD Wholesales, for, for these prices. Okay, apologies. We are still trying to connect with uh, Martin. Hello, good afternoon. Would you like me to share slides from my end? Okay, so you're ready to begin now? Okay. Um,
Great. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. It's wonderful to have the opportunity to join you today for the 2023 Palau Health Summit. I'm very grateful for this opportunity, and I hope that you've been having a very good day's worth of discussions. So I'm here, as you can see in the agenda, to talk about addressing health equity in NCD prevention and management. Uh, my name is Martin Taylor. I'm the director of the Division of Health Systems and Services in the WHO Western Pacific region. And my division works very closely with our other divisions who are responsible for non-communicable non disease control. So first of all, why are we talking about this? Um, first of all, to put in a little bit of context for Palau. So progress on universal health coverage has been good in Palau in recent years. You can see on the left, the graph that shows the improvement in access to services, basically showing that more healthcare services are available to the population in Palau. So there's been improvement in recent years, but this is a scale of naught to 100. So you can see that at present, just below 60, there is still some way to go. The graph on the right is showing us that health spending is, um, including significant prepaid private spending and out-of-pocket spending, and that the cost of healthcare is projected to keep increasing in the coming years. This increasing cost could put a challenge on the financial sustainability of the healthcare system. So why do we need to focus on NCDs in this context? It's because, of course, non-communicable diseases are the significant and growing burden on the healthcare system. You can see here, I'm sure this data is familiar to you, that many of the top 10 causes of mortality in Palau are non-communicable diseases. So that's where we need to be focusing our significant attention. Non-communicable diseases remain not just that in terms of mortality and morbidity, but also the main cause of disability, adjust life, ad disability adjusted life years lost, um, which is an important uh, metric for the impact of those on the broader health of the population. So again, non-communicable diseases is the key for focus. The risk factors of this are all known to us. And you can see again, the um, top uh, risk factors here and linking them again to non-communicable diseases. Much of those relate to risk factors that we all know about. Poor diet, tobacco, alcohol, insufficient exercise they constitute some of the biggest risk factors which are driving this epidemic of non-communicable diseases. And at present, our healthcare systems across the region are not particularly well set up to deal with this growing burden of non-communicable diseases. You can see here, the blue slide, the blue part at the bottom of each graph is the curative and rehabilitative care. What this is showing us is that our healthcare systems focus much more on curing sick people, usually in hospitals, and not preventive care, which is the very light gray part in these slides. This is the distribution of finance, which shows it's mostly on curative care. This is from general government expenditure. And then when we dive a little bit deeper into health expenditure by type of service, we get the same kind of picture. We're spending a lot of money in our region on, on curing people in inexpensive hospitals rather than preventing people from getting sick in the first place in um, primary health care or looking after them in primary health care after they are sick. We can also see from this that inequity in non-communicable diseases persist. This shows us from two perspectives. The first is an average across the Western Pacific region on the left hand side of access to healthcare services. And you can see that in three of those lines, there has been an improvement in the last 20 years. The red line is the only line where there's been actually a decrease in services available, and that's for non-communicable diseases. Second, on the right-hand side, you can see the um, population across our region suffering from financial hardship. Now, this is actually puts our region in the context of other regions in the world, and the green line shows you that in our region, we actually see greater populations suffering from final financial hardship now than we did 20 years ago. So what this is telling us is for non-communicable diseases is that less people are able to access the care that they need, whether that's prevention or treatment or long-term management. 
and also that people are suffering more financial hardship when they're accessing those services. This is not a sustainable system for managing non-communicable diseases in the future. So we've covered, I think, all, so far, some of the parts on the left of this. A greater number of non-communicable diseases, people living longer. We know that this has an increasing burden on the population. People need to be cared for for longer. And at present, there's too much reliance on specialist care. The impact of the, this in the long term can be major. The impact and the consequences could include increased morbidity and mortality, increased costs of healthcare over time, which could make the health system financially unsustainable, a risk to the sustainability of healthcare systems, and of course this has an impact on the productivity of people, their ability to work, for children's ability to study. So all of this has an impact on the great on the broader economy of the country. So we know what will be the consequences if we don't take action and we know the direction that we're heading in. So the question is what can we need what can we do? The good news is that there's plenty of things that we can do to stop this future epidemic of non-communicable diseases and to get the healthcare system ready. To put it simply, what we need to be doing is focused on the top left here. We need to start earlier screening and detection. For example, of hypertension, diabetes. Get those people into the healthcare system sooner so that they can have affordable or avail available medicines and healthcare. We need to have models of healthcare that mean that those people can get the care that they need closer to the community, that they don't have to travel for a long time. And there's lots of other things that we need to do on the right hand side, which I'll go into in more detail when we speak about primary health care across the region. So how can primary health care help us be the solution to much of these challenges? Um, so this takes us through this slide, some of the attributes of primary health care on the left hand side and links those to their role in addressing non-communicable non diseases. Just to give you an example, for a few of them. Primary healthcare, a key attribute is it's person-centered, comprehensive through people's life courses. So people can get care throughout their life and that it is centered around their needs. So their visits to healthcare centers are, vis are, are planned around their needs, maybe taking account of multiple different health conditions at the same time, rather than needing multiple conditions. There's also a key part to this around community participation, having the community engaged so that everybody can be engaged in making sure that their population is healthier. It's about shifting the healthcare system to creating a healthy population rather than caring for a sick population. And primary healthcare is at the centre of this because family physicians or nurse practitioners or rural health workers are key to being able to share information and work with the community to promote healthy lifestyles, but also key to the early detection of non-communicable diseases and key to the long-term management of those through the healthcare system. So turning quickly to why we needed a new approach to primary healthcare in the region. The old approach that we've had to primary healthcare has been good, but it's been good for different con contexts and conditions. And now across the region, we have a very different change in situation. We have massive demographic changes as populations get older. We have increased non-communicable diseases. We're beginning to see the impact of climate change on health, and we have health security threats. We're doing this at a time when many economies in our region are advancing, but there are still many in inequities. And we also have, as you know, a very diverse region with some very large countries and economies and small island developing states. Within this, of course, we also have the rise of digital technologies and innovation, which enable us to provide healthcare, and in particular primary healthcare, in many new ways. So last year, we took to our regional committee meeting in October, a framework for reimagining the future of primary healthcare, essentially to help primary healthcare be ready for the challenges of the future, and in particular, non-communicable diseases. So in the next few slides, I will say a little bit about what that framework outlines as the way to reimagine primary health care for the region so that it can be ready to support us in the challenge of dealing with non-communicable diseases. 
The framework outlined five key attributes of primary healthcare. I've touched on these a little bit already. First of all, that primary healthcare should be people and community centered. What this means is that it is organized around the needs of people and communities, not around physical healthcare buildings. That it takes account of the whole of the person's needs, their family situation, and it engages communities. Essentially what it means is making sure that healthcare systems are there when people need them to be there, where people need them to be there. Primary healthcare is also important for continuity. That means continuity throughout the course of somebody's life, from childhood through to late adulthood. It also means continuity in terms of continuity of services. So that with primary healthcare, if somebody starts at a local rural health centre and then is referred to a hospital or a specialist provider and then back to a primary healthcare centre again or a rural health centre, this is all well linked up together and it is all considered part of one multidisciplinary team, not different fragmented services. Thirdly, primary healthcare needs to be of high quality and equitable. Primary healthcare is proven to be the best way to provide equitable healthcare. By being closer to the population, it can address all population groups, regardless of their social, economic, dem dem demographic, geographic, or other cultural factors. High quality primary health care is by far more cost effective than other specialized care as well. Fourthly, primary health care needs to be integrated. That means a seamless transition between all levels in the healthcare system when there are referrals. That means referrals up and referrals back down and linked to other services when needed. And these may be in the community. They could be mental health services. They could be other social care other needs that can have an impact on people's health. And fifthly, primary health care needs to be innovative. At present, we're seeing with new technologies, many ways in which we can be inno innovative in the delivery of health care. People wearing devices that can send information straight to a primary health care center so that they don't need to necessarily go in for screening unless the data that their devices are sending shows that there's a problem to be uh, looked at. So there's many new opportunities for innovation in primary health care delivery. So how do we take this forward? This is a quick kind of conceptualization of how we would take this forward with people and the community right at the center, maintain with a primary health care system developed to, first of all, maintain wellness. We're looking at trying to help people avoid becoming sick in the first place. Secondly, to care for illness and injury when that happens. Thirdly, primary health care looks at the broader system and the environment that we know impacts on people's health. And that could include things like water and sanitation, could look at things like education, the broader environment, housing, etc. And then fourthly, social well-being, recognizing that people's general social well-being has an impact on their health. The primary health care framework that we developed has five key strategic actions to help make sure that we can deliver this new primary health care of the future. Those five are listed on the left. These are the areas where member states need to be taking action to put in place primary health care for the future. Models of service delivery re refers to developing the right kind of models for primary health care in different country contexts. Empowering individuals and communities is vital. I've said a little bit about that already. Thirdly, workforce and provider base. We need to make sure that we have the right workforce trained to do the right things in the right place to be able to deliver primary health care. Fourthly, we need to ensure that there is adequate financing for primary health care and that the incentives in the healthcare system in encourage increased productivity of primary health care. And fifth and finally, we need to make sure that the enabling and supportive environment is in place, which is includes, um, which is in, includes the other aspects of uh, livelihoods that contribute to health. We just talked about water and sanitation, for example. Our primary health care framework provides under each of these five a set of specific actions that can be taken. I won't go into detail on all of these, 
but these are the actions that can be taken by member states to help them strengthen and re-envisage re their primary health care for the future. There's many actions across them, but I'm just going to highlight one now, which is the first one, models of service delivery. This is vital and it's at the center of any work to strengthen primary health care. When we take the attributes that we've already discussed and apply those in different contexts, we, will then, we can then think through what primary health care needs to look like in different contexts. That will be important, for example, when we're thinking about the geography, how far it is to secondary or specialist care. When we're thinking about the healthcare workforce that is needed and getting the right healthcare workforce in the local area for that local um, model of primary health care and service delivery. How rural and remote, how densely populated the population is. All of these factors will need to be taken into account, as well as the disease burden and non-communicable diseases is a significant part of that. Once we've developed the right model of service delivery for primary health care, we can then begin to think about how we put together the workforce, the financing, how we use innovation, and how we engage populations and communities in promoting health, preventing people from becoming sick, but also the role of primary health care when needed in looking after people who have become sick. So this begins to show some of the links between our primary health care and our non-communicable disease framework. So I mentioned the, the primary health care framework that went to our regional committee last year. You'll also be aware that there was a non-communicable disease framework. And these five boxes here show some of the links between our primary health care framework and our non-communicable disease framework. The first part is, of course, developing clear strategies and supported by the right workforce. We need the right workforce for dealing with non-communicable diseases in primary health care settings. We need to have the service delivery models in place, and we need to establish and strengthen the mechanisms by which we can make sure that non-communicable diseases detects non-clinical diseases early through screening and then can bring populations in for further care when needed, but also to engage um, the population to promote healthy lifestyles. A key part of our local primary healthcare service delivery model will be the delivery packages for priority non-communicable diseases, which have been widely used in many countries in the Pacific. Now, some of this is new, but some of this is not new, and there are models that we can look at from other countries. Here is just one very simple example that was developed in Australia, in a remote area, Thursday Island, in northern Australia, where an individual, a man who was living with diabetes, couldn't keep coming to a clinic to see different doctors about different parts of his health care on a regular basis because the travel to the clinic was taking too long. So through the course of this innovation in Australia, they managed to change a system where he had three specialist appointments booked over two weeks, and which would then also require a fourth visit to actually develop a system where he could go to the, 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 the primary health care system and only have one visit, one appointment, where he could meet all of those different health care providers that he needed to see. This was a fairly simple model that was developed um, and is then, then being trialled and rolled out. In particular, it has high value for a number of different diseases, but it can be used for any patients. We can see in this case, it was for somebody who needed care for diabetes, renal and cardiac uh, specialist clinics. But this kind of model can be used in other contexts for a wide range of different diseases. And this is a good example of providing people-centered care care that is tailored around the needs of the person, in this case, somebody who needed care over three with three different specialists, plus a GP, and needed to go and travel some distance for that care, and so to reduce the travel time and increase the convenience and the efficiency of that person's primary health care. So that concludes with an example. I conclude the presentation with a few questions for your consideration as you're having your discussion through the course of this week at the Health Summit. The first is, how can non-communicable disease services be better integrated within primary health care in Palau? What are the concrete actions that need to be taken? How can multidisciplinary teams work together to deliver non-communicable disease, non disease services?
in the country. And linked to that, how can cross-sectoral collaboration be improved? Are there specific linkages that we need to be building between the health sector and other sectors to look at non-clinical disease care in Palau? And then finally, how can we manage the really important aspect of engaging communities more and empowering them to take responsibility, not just in terms of promoting and promoting good health, but also their role in thinking about the models of care for primary health care and non-clinical diseases, and their role in the core decision making around non-clinical diseases. There's a number of questions to think through there, and I think our primary health care and non-communicable disease regional frameworks that were published last year could be useful guides to help think through some of those for Palau. So in conclusion, what I would say is that Palau, like many countries in our region, is facing some common challenges. The challenges of growing non-communicable diseases, growing health care costs, and the need to revisit the health care system, a health care system that is hospital-centred is not well equipped for the future, not well equipped for non-communicable diseases, and is financially unsustainable. So when it comes to thinking about the healthcare systems that we need for the future, a healthcare system that is based on primary healthcare, but still has a role, specialist role for hospitals is important, and that that primary healthcare system of the future needs to be developed around the needs for non-communicable diseases, about promoting health, about early detection and screening and getting people into the healthcare system quickly so that they can get the treatment that they need. In particular, of course, for high priority diseases, in particular, for example, for diabetes and hypertension, but this can go for a wide range of non chemical diseases and others as well. So thank you very much for inviting me to join you today and to present on some of the work that we're thinking about across our region and its relevance for Palau. And I look forward, if there's time, to any questions and discussion and hope that you have fruitful further conversations through the rest of this week. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you again, Director Martin Taylor, for your presentation. Our next talk is, is on uh, Palau's Omicron experience. This is going to be uh, presented to us. Uh, by Dr. Uh, Myra Adelby Fraser, MBBS, who is an internist at our Belau National Hospital, along with Dr. Catherine Darong, who is the Deputy Director for AHEC and is a physician at uh, Belau National Hospital. Dr. Adelby. Ali? Oh, <laughs> Mike, <Mic'd laughs> just testing. Oh, okay, Sula. Okay, oh. Sula, and uh, thank you everybody for the opportunity for us to present. Um, uh, Sula, for, well, just to reintroduce, um, some of you may know me as uh, Dr. Myra. I work at the hospital. Um, I cover internal medicine, and I also have with me uh, Dr. Kate Daerong, and the both of us will be presenting on our um, Palau Omicron experience. Uh, so if I can have my slides up. So um, actually this was, um, uh, we did a very similar presentation last year to some of our uh, doctors and friends in the USAPI, and uh, this was during um, the time that we had peaked on our Omicron and community transmission, and the purpose for us was really just to share some of uh, the things that we learned along the way, and also to encourage, you know, other doctors that, you know, this is uh, something that we, when we work together, we can come through. So we're kind of excited to s share with you some pictures and uh, things that we we did on, uh, on the island.
Oh, okay. Please, let's give them uh, five minutes to take care of uh, that technical difficulty. Five minutes. Eh? Okay. Sorry, my slides were, uh, I think they're 60 plus, so it's still uploading. <laughs> so, five minutes uh, restroom break. <laughs> yeah. So, while we have uh, five minutes, let me just make a couple of announcements. So, uh, please do not forget to complete and submit uh, back to us uh, evaluation forms. There are hard copies at the registration table. Uh, please uh, fill those uh, and return them uh, by at least by Thursday afternoon. Again, there are hard copies for folks who uh, cannot go online and complete the evaluation forms. We thank you for that. Um, also, again, want to remind everybody to please, if you're coming back uh, for the rest of the summit, to bring your water bottles as we provide dispensers with water only, but we do not uh, provide uh, any uh, drinking uh, utensils. Again, Jake from MD uh, Wholesales is reminding me to tell you guys to keep your non-winning raffle tickets. Um, they are good for the remaining of the days of the summit. So if you didn't win today, keep your ticket, bring them back tomorrow, uh, for and hope you win tomorrow. But again, uh, the grand prize uh, on Thursday, you must be present to win. The evaluation forms are at the registration table. And then the online one will be ready by Wednesday afternoon, which is tomorrow. Just another quick reminder, registration for uh, each day for the summit begins at 7.15 in the morning up to 8.15. Uh, and all plenary sessions are held here at the uh, PNOC gym, uh, sorry, beginning at 8.30 until noon. And then the breakout sessions are happening at the other uh, uh, venues, and those uh, to, uh, will begin at 1 p.m. Uh, uh, until 3, three o'clock. Again, the, bus, uh, the the transportation schedule is posted on the, the doors, the entry doors. Uh, you can reference that for the times and the destinations of those. We appreciate your patience. And it looks like they might be ready. I think if, if the slides don't come up, we're going to have to dance. <laughs> All right. 
and uh, so long for your patience. Uh, okay, so we'll start our presentation. Um, so uh, before we move forward, I just wanted to, you know, for some of our guests who are with us uh, from off island, thank you for visiting our beautiful tiny island. Uh, we have a population of 16,733 based on our latest census. We have 340 islands, and our size is uh, about 180 square miles. So, so natu uh, natural hazards and disasters that we face include typhoons, drought, tidal surges, you know, perhaps some uh, things that we see as a result of climate change. And this can also produce a lot of risk of um, illnesses, especially for us on the islands. Uh, more than 50% of our GDP comes from tourism. Okay, next slide. And this is how Palau looks like from an aerial view. Next slide. That's the Koro City. And then this is actually one of the beaches that we see here. And I'm hoping this will, um, you know, uh, compensate for the rainy uh, weather outside. I think uh, Dr. Selena from Fiji brought the rainy weather when she came. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> and then a uh, bunch of various activities that I hope that if you don't get to do some this visit, please do come back and do them again. And I want to show the right side corner. That's actually a picture of our jellyfish lake. Where and uh, it's a very unique lake with stingless jellyfish. And definitely a must see while you're here. Okay, next slide. For the health service coverage, uh, the main health facility on the island uh, is Belau National Hospital. It was built in 1992. This is a, we have 80 bed capacity and we are able to surge to 100. We have four beds right now dedicated for ICU and telemetry. Six beds serve as the step down. Once patients are stabilized, we put them in the six beds. And then we have four main inpatient wards they are, uh, which covers the general services, including medical, surgical, peds, uh, behavioral health, uh, ob and, and such. In terms of our COVID-19 preparations, we have about five negative pressure isolation wards in which previous to the uh, outbreak, we mostly use them for TB patients. So you can imagine um, how it was for us to prepare from five isolation wards especially when we were seeing more cases coming in. Eight, we have eight health um, community health centers, which provides uh, normally pre-COVID, we have uh, had regular uh, visits, especially for the medical department to conduct NCD uh, follow-ups. And the purpose of you know, expansion and doing things is to provide um, the same sort of services and care to rural areas. So it's more like disseminating health services or decentralizing. And then uh, we have also outpatient services which are both covered at the National Hospital and in the CHCs. And our emergency department opens 24 hours. Okay. Hospital capacity, we do have a laboratory available, ECG, ultrasound, we have endoscopy hyperbaric chamber, and recently we acquired high flow nasal cannulas, so we have capabilities to provide uh, high flow oxygen support, and we also have uh, ventilators available on the island. Okay, thank you. So I wanted to share um, just a brief overview of our COVID-19 timeline. So starting in March 20, 2020, this is when our country instituted a border closure to prevent introduction of COVID-19 coming in. On July 31st, uh, this is when uh, Palau, when we initiated the model for repatriation, which included a pre-quarantine process. In January 3, this is when we started to um, institute vaccination campaign. And on June 2021, uh, this is when the pre-quarantine um, process was removed and we institute vaccination and testing requirements instead for entry. On August 20 of 2021, we had our two cases of travelers um, after being on island for five days. Uh, they, were, uh, they were identified as um, uh, with COVID and there were no further transmissions. And these cases were sequenced as Delta. 
On December 27 of 2021, Palau identifies additional cases of COVID-19 in fully vaccinated travelers. And by January 13, we had our community transmission and from here it rapidly accelerated. So this is a picture that I wanted to share. This is a picture on January 3. And uh, this is when we started off with our COVID vaccination with uh, Moderna. And this is a photo of one of our doctors, Dr. Sylvia Osar, who was the first person in Palau to receive the vaccine that Sunday. And uh, this was administered by one of our nurse champion, Amos. Next slide. Okay, this is a very spiky slide. <laughs> Basically, this is just to um, show towards the uh, very right end, your right end. Uh, it, this indicates that by the time we already had started to have community transmission, we were already um, enrolling our additional dosing, meaning to say majority of our community and uh, those who were eligible for vaccination had already received full, um, had been fully vaccinated and we were already now going on to the uh, additional dosing. So this was a really big help, especially for us in terms of uh, managing um, or um, preventing cases from coming in with really severe disease. Okay, next slide, please. And uh, this slide is just uh, to show that um, at that time we have uh, achieved more than our target, which was 80% of eligible uh, persons to receive their vaccine. And this is uh, for those who are over the age of five years old. And the next slide is the same thing. It will show that at this time that we already had community uh, transmission, we had already achieved more than our 80% target and we were in the process of giving additional doses. And I just wanted to say thanks to Dr. Thane Hancock, who when we first started um, putting, um, when we started this press series of presentation to the USAPI, uh, he helped pr um, make s uh, put together and explain some of the slides and data to us, so especially for us to understand. And I kind of borrowed his slides with his permission. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Next slide, please. Mm -mm. So if you can see here, this uh, chart shows the new COVID-19 cases by detection rate, and it also includes um, our COVID-19 hospital uh, census and um, the seven-day case rate. Uh, I think what's important to look here is that you can really see that on January 28, uh, we peaked with 371 new cases, and that's that blue um, uh, block that goes up into the sky. And then from there, I'd like for you to see that our hospitalization rates sort of maintain the same. It did peak a little bit, I think one about one and a half week after we peaked new cases. So that's just something that we, we were seeing um, from our census. Uh, so the data does have some limitation because this is only collected from patients that would have been presented or to the ministry or those that were tested eh? because we, we would have uh, symptomatic cases in the community that wouldn't have been documented. And uh, at that time, the, um, at the peak of uh, our uh, co community transmission, we had a case rate of 6,235 per 100,000 persons. Okay, and this is uh, this reflects the daily new rate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think that's it. Next slide. And so I will hand over to um, my colleague here, who's going to be sharing her experience about the uh, COVID nineteen treatment in the outpatient and public health arm. Okay, thank you. Ali. Uh, are you guys still alive and <laughs> awake? Okay, this will be fast. So um, I'm going to present on the, uh, our experience at the outpatient department and uh, out in the communities. So um, here we go. Just go like that. So our key ob objectives at uh, that time was to meet the demand uh, at the, the outpatient department because you know, at that time, people were, you know, um, they were worried, scared. They wanted to be tested. They wanted to come into the outpatient to get tested and make sure they didn't have it. 
and not to pass it along to their family members. Uh, also, uh, we uh, uh, we needed to uh, connect the testing with the uh, treatment, the therapies that was that was uh, available at that time, and then uh, we needed to increase the access uh, to others who were not living in Koror or who were not ab able to uh, uh, have their uh, transportation to come in uh, to be tested and treated, and also um, uh, what we did at that time was. The uh, to have a C4 a mini uh, C4 approach or a mini C4 approach, and C4 is a uh, sense for uh, the community. We stood up the community uh, COVID care center, and it was uh, this place uh, provided a safe place for uh, COVID-19 clinical assessment and triage, and protected the national hospital from being over overrun with likely infectious cases seeking primary care or re reassurance, uh, and also provide a place to receive information for home isolation. So uh, those people who didn't require uh, to be hospitalized and were able to go home is where they, uh, is, uh, where they got the, the information from. That's where the C4 was. And uh, it's to provide a, a site to promote and um, administer critical outpatient COVID-19 therapeutics to high-risk cases in order to prevent hospitalizations. Such, and we um, provided oral Paxlovid or Molnupiravir and IV Sotrovimab at that time. So that's our community uh, C4 center. It's right next to the Belau Nas National Ho Hospital. It's a, uh, a gym that we converted it to a, uh, an outpatient clinic and a testing uh, area. So um, we had to plan on how to um, uh, receive the patient or the client, and, uh, uh, and that's how we set up the place. Uh, we have the, the registration area, wa waiting area, the rapid testing area, the lab wa waiting area, and the clinical assessment by the nurses, and and also doctors, and the, the contact tracing uh, or CDU folks who gave out the home kits and instructions on how to isolate. So we had a lot of partners. We didn't do this on our own. We had partners from the CDC, HRSA, and the U.S. Embassy and Department of uh, Defense and the CAT team also. And that thing that is uh, right next to them is a actually a fan that has ice in it. And because at that place it got too hot. So, and also it uh, provided a place for the ventilation flow. So we uh, put it behind us to uh, help uh, with the flow of the air in the room. Uh, so that's where the registration was. That's actually the beginning, so it's not really crowded. As the news went out uh, that uh, there is available testing and treatment, then it became more uh, crowded. So the testing. So when we set up the, uh, the C4 testing area, we had a lot of people come in. And at that time, we had the Binax. Uh, uh, rapid antigen test. It uh, gave only a 15 minute uh, waiting time and we were able to process about 300 uh, tests per day. And the posit positivity range uh, was from 30 to 60 percent uh, and that's from symptomatic cases. So there uh, you can see uh, Miss Lorraine uh, and triaging uh, a whole family who comes who came in for testing and counseling. And uh, that's uh, at the back. You can see the doctors uh, doing the clinical assessment. So so at that period of time, uh, we found out that we had uh, Omicron. And we, at that time, we had uh, the this uh, drugs available to use. 
to use at that time, uh, which is uh, the antivirus, uh, monoprivil, and uh, evusil, and sotrovima. So those were the uh, medications that were given uh, to us to use at that time. Okay. So Dr. Um, Brostrom and Dr. Thane, uh, they worked with us and ca uh, came up with this uh, COVID clinical ther therapeutic form. So because of uh, we had a lot of patients coming in, we had to have a form or a, a way to assess which patient gets to have a treatment and which who do not. Because of the other side effects of this medication, we had to make sure that we give it to the right people because of uh, it was not available uh, to a lot of people. So uh, those are the doctors who gave out the th therapeutics and the nurse giving the, the IV medication to the patient. And uh, about two, two weeks into the, um, the setup, uh, we, we had a lot of uh, things uh, to, to refle reflect back and um, think about. Uh, so. Uh, we uh, we learned that we had we it was best to quickly discharge individuals who tested negative, and um, and we learned that we 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 needed to give them uh, handouts for negative results because at that time, um, I even though you're negative, you know we can always turn positive at a later date, and uh, to make things go faster. Uh, we, instead of counseling each individual person, we put them into a group and then counsel them at one time so it made it faster to uh, uh, make the flow, uh, people go. So what we learned was to better to separate the regist registration and not to mix people, like the, um, the mixing process and clinical management of positive cases and uh, we needed to avoid mixing at the C4 site, meaning that um, sick and not, not sick people were all gathered in one group at the, uh, the site, at the C4. So while waiting, they can actually transmit the disease to the next person who was not sick at that time. So it, it, the concern was for C4 becoming a place for C4 tr as COVID transmission registration and testing. Uh, so we had the registration and testing area moved to an, the nearby hospital, which is, was uh, next, right next door, as you can see in the picture. Um, so only individuals who tested positive at the testing area were moved to the C4. So we can give them uh, uh, the therapeutics they needed. Uh, with this uh, change, uh, we greatly saw a lot of people who needed to be seen. And um, we, um, the maximum capacity uh, increased from 250 uh, people to 600 testing per day at that time. So after seeing people in Koror, uh, we had to uh, create smaller mobile clinic uh, COVID uh, community care center to uh, uh, to bring to those who couldn't come into Koror for testing. Uh, so there's uh, four community health centers in Babeldaab. So this uh, uh, mini C4 was to provide COVID-19 services to the, those hard to reach uh, populations uh, and also provide outpatient COVID-19 uh, treatment to high risk individuals and also provide uh, training and instruction to community health center staff for COVID-19 uh, rapid testing and referral of high risk uh, patients. So that van is the, the vehicle of transport that we, uh, we used to go from one uh, CHC to another. So you can see the team there was Dr. Borstrom, uh, the nurse and the lab, lab and uh, the resident and also the uh, uh, medical records 
that consists of the one team that went out at that time. And so, um, as you remember, uh, when we first tested for COVID, we had to do a, um, a very uh, uncomfortable test. Uh, and then uh, as time went on, we, uh, we learned that we can, we had tests available that can. Seven minutes. Oh, thank you. Um, so there was um, tests that were available that we can self-administer, even kids. Uh, were taught to do it themselves. And uh, that's uh, uh, another doctor and a medical records person uh, explaining to a, a client, uh, non-English uh, speaking client, on what the uh, process is and what COVID is and the therapeutics. That's out in the, at the Western Community Health Center. So, uh, we also uh, gave, we treated patients who uh, needed treatment, even IV uh, medications. And what we did was, uh, if uh, the patient was stable enough, we gave the treatment outside of the clinic so that we don't uh, uh, contam contaminate the clinic while uh, doing it. Okay. So you know Palau is, uh, has other islands outside of the Bubble Dao, and um, we had to go uh, and do an outreach to the Southern Community Health Center. We, extend the, we extended the uh, mini seafood to remote health center in the outlying uh, island of Peleliu. So at that time, we combined the vac vaccination program with a screening to add the boosters and test and, and also do clinical evaluation for the, the people of uh, Peleliu. And so that's another way to go to Peleliu. <laughs> that was fun. Um, that's the team uh, going out to the, the island on your, on the left side is uh, the residents, uh, the residents uh, were the frontliners, and we thank them so much. That's Dr. Jason, Rachel, and Soon, and the intern. Uh, okay, and uh, and that's I'd like to uh, have uh, Dr. Myra come in and explain on the, uh, on the hospi hospitalization of the COVID patients. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, I think um, the picture of the physicians is actually um, a really good thing to highlight because it shows that you know whenever there's a need that arises, I think it's uh, having the flexibility to involve everybody in your healthcare team and a delegation of tasks. Yeah? And uh, you know the dentists were also helping us at the uh, outpatient centers in terms of the triaging and screening. So this was a really, it was a big team effort. So it's my turn again. <laughs> so I'm gonna be sharing uh, the COVID-19 hospitalization um, uh, data and just the things that we kind of saw. Uh, next slide. So uh, from, the, uh, from January 20 to February 17 of 2022, uh, we had a total of 50 admissions and 34% of them uh, were, due, were primary with uh, were admitted primary due to COVID pneumonia, and uh, our age, uh, the range of age, <laughs> was less than a year uh, years old to 98 years old at the uh, uh, oldest, and median wa uh, was 64 years of age. And then um, the table that was oh sorry the table that was uh, previously shown was um, by gender and age group as well. So this one shows um, sort of the, it's, it's a story about how we um, had uh, our first COVID ward um, starting, we had about, remember, five isolation rooms. So we started to put patients that required hospitalization into those um, five isolation room. And then after January 25, we had an increase 
jump of patience. So then we were facing, what do we do? We, where do we find this space? So from there, we moved into one of the buildings that we had. That um, This was actually um, just being fi uh, uh, finalized, and it was still, they were still putting in the, I think, the floorings. And then we ended up using that as the first COVID ward. And that had, um, uh, we had capabilities to ho uh, have about 15 patients there. But then as time moved along with the uh, onset of the community transmission, we ended up having requiring uh, more space for more patients. So we uh, ended up moving and converting uh, the medical ward of the hospital, uh, which has a 35-bed capacity to the new COVID ward. And we moved all of our patients there. And all of the non-COVID patients were moved into the surgical uh, ward. I think at this time, we were also facing temporary staffing shortages, uh, shortages in nursing, shortages in ancillary services due to COVID infections. So the the challenge that we faced at this time that we were looking is how do we get nurses to cover the wards? So this is why we said instead of opening other areas, we will just utilize what we have in the ward and move from another building back to the hospital, but separated, if that makes sense. And at this time, we had teams from ASPER and HHS coming to help us set up because some of the rooms we really needed to convert in case we had severe cases that would require um, ventilated patients and we had to make sure that it was safe to have patients there and we had to make sure that it was um, you know uh, for safe for both the healthcare workers uh, the team and the patients okay next slide so vaccination status of all admissions to the COVID ward when we started collecting the data we first started collecting on a logbook and then later on we started to understand how to use um, tools to collect and then this is what we came in. And this is really because of the help of all our um, friends. When they came over, they were helping us collecting the data and putting together the graphs. So we did see that 32% were unvaccinated. And this is for patients coming in for all admissions to the COVID ward because they came in with COVID-19. And this is regardless if they came in primarily due to COVID pneumonia or for other reasons. 32% were unvaccinated and 8 were partially uh, vaccinated and during this time we were able to have a uh, vaccination coverage for them while they were admitted as well and during the recovery thank you uh, this uh, slide shows patients admitted with a covid pneumonia and we had a 39 percent of them were unvaccinated and 11 percent were partially vaccinated also home after recovery we, we recovery we offered vaccination The the infograph on the right is actually the vaccination report. Looks like, and uh, at this time we had um, during the peak of our cases we had five uh, mortalities, and they uh, the ages were between 52 to 92, with a median age of 72. A hundred percent, all of them were with comorbidities. Um, three of them, uh, three 60 percent unvaccinated and 40% were vaccinated, but at that time uh, not boosted. And when we looked in retrospect, the time that they um, they did from you know uh, their last dose or the second, the, the when they completed the series to onset of their symptoms, it would have been more than, um, more than three to six months. Okay, uh, inpatient management. Uh, so you know, at this at this point, we we're really thinking. Let's. What are some key objectives? What are we going to do now? So number one, we really wanted to highlight was infection prevention and control. And how do we make sure that you know healthcare workers stay safe? And how do we make sure that we do not have um, spread or infection inside the hospital? Number two is managing patients with COVID-19 and other medical comorbidities. And this uh, was very important to highlight because uh, we do see a lot of other conditions and especially in Palau being um, with our NCD uh, prevalence increasing, we wanted to understand and know how to manage our cases who came in with advanced cardiovascular disease. What are some recommendations for them? We also wanted to learn how to uh, manage patients who are at risk, those who have asthma, if patients present with severe respiratory distress, how do we manage and how do we uh, help with these cases? 
So third, we also said, okay, we need to think about how we can surge and how can we meet the bed demands because this is was a, this was a big issue that we initially faced coming from five to 14 and then now a need of 20 plus space. So when we were already occupying the medical ward, um, uh, uh, the, the whole medical ward, that's when we were thinking, okay, if I'm on call and I have another five patients, where do we search? So this was a really important thing for us, um, especially going through this process. And um, lastly, we, we also said, okay, uh, what's really important to highlight was providing appropriate care to moderate to severe COVID cases in hospitals. So this would include what is our monitoring um, tool that we use? How do we see the patients if they're in isolation? So we used uh, surveillance. Um, we had a camera set up as well. Uh, oxygen, how do we make sure that all the patients that need oxygen get them? High flow nasal cannula was a new modality. So training for all the staff and the healthcare workers on how to use this. Ventilation, so the challenge that we did see was um, on an island where you have only one anesthetist and no respiratory therapist, how do we manage? So this is when we had um, lots of peer-to-peer -peer trainings. We even set up a YouTube uh, videos and a site for everyone to review on how to set up the high flow nasal cannula and the ventilators that we have. And then therapeutics, do, how do we manage? What, is the, what are the guidelines and recommendations? So as you can see, we did have a lot of work. So, and we were grateful that we had the time to sort of brainstorm and think about this before the, yeah. Okay, thanks. So I've already kind of mentioned a little bit about the, some of the solutions and I wanted to share the picture that um, while we were having uh, cases coming in, we set up the back of the chapel which was outside and that was our resting station and the picture <laughs> that we have there, we're actually performing a fit test and this is when you have to uh, make sure that your N95s fit right, because we felt this was very important, especially as part of um, protection for the healthcare workers. And uh, for ensuring adequate oxygen supply, we were faced with how do we ensure that our oxygen plant would be able to give out enough oxygen. I think historically, uh, we've had cases where we would try to ventilate more than two cases, and then we would have inadequate supplies. So what we did was we had all patients that required low flow um, oxygen. We put them on oxygen concentrator and then we would use, um, maximize all of the oxygen supplies if need be for those on high flow nasal cannula. And then we also learned how to connect um, big H2 tanks of oxygen using a high pressure, um, there's a term for it. It's a, it's a connection, <laughs> sorry for that. My brother's a biomed, so he's going to be so mad at me that I forgot the word. <laughs> but it basically connects, um, it provides um, pressure. I think it's a high pressure something mechanic. Anyway, it, w it, it enables us to connect high flow nasal cannulas and uh, vents to uh, tanks. And this can be used in limited resource settings. And um, preventing exposure to other patients, you know, we really learned this by um, being watchful of the patient's attendance. So I'm really sorry because there was a time where we said, um, okay, no more visitors because we were worried about cases or patients coming, or I mean visitors coming in with asymptomatic um, COVID-19 and spreading it to some of the vulnerable patients in the ward. Okay, so the next slide will show a picture of our training uh, in the medical library setting up the high flow nasal cannula. And I wanna share that this was the time that Peace Winds was on island uh, from Japan and Dr. Um, Inaba and his team were there. And when we had our first case, in, uh, first case that required high flow nasal cannula, he was actually also present to help me um, learn how to set it up and supervise in the beginning. And after that, we were, um, we, we started, we've been starting to use it more often and we also developed a protocol on the next slide. So this is something that we had um, sort of drafted and he shared with us and we've been using this in the wards as well. 
And from this time, we also started drafting other protocols, including protocols for, ve ve um, for uh, ventilation and weaning. So more pictures about the fit testing and the new staff lounge. Uh, this is where we would eat, and we had a beautiful view of the ocean and fresh air. Uh, this was the first COVID ward. So this one has hospital beds uh, in total, and then it can surge up to 25. Okay. And then uh, this was when we had uh, exceeded, um, when we reached about more than 70 patients, we <laughs> were thinking, OK, I think we, m we should move because we might be having more cases. So this is when we moved to the medical ward. And the medical ward is a uh, rig type. So uh, the advantage that we had was you have about four beds in one section. And with that, we can uh, effectively separate patients that would require different terms of care. An example is if we have patients with wounds, like those with um, MRSA, that we would be worried about mixing them with other cases, we can put um, one area. So that was an advantage that we saw with this type of um, moving to the medical ward. And we also had opened all the windows to allow the air to dilute, which helps a lot with the ventilation. And then we made a plan that if we did have patients that would require um, you know, uh, maybe procedures that's, that would uh, be highly um, uh, aerosolized, uh, uh, like generating um, procedures, then we would put them in the negative pressure rooms. So as we were moving along, we started to come up with processes and, and maybe, yeah. It was a really good experience for us and uh, um, t time for us to discuss a lot. <laughs> we made some changes in the emergency department. We had uh, screening. We had people screening outside. And this would help us understand uh, once you do present with um, positive uh, COVID-19, uh, then you will be placed in a section separated from others also to prevent the spread. And then the other picture was uh, the 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 area in the ER where COVID-19 patients would be um, managed or treated um, or stabilized before transferring back to the, up to the wards. In terms of our high-risk groups, uh, we really wanted to continue to provide coverage and support. So we had homebound team continuing with their vaccination, testing and vaccination. And if patients also required treatment, they were also being offered treatment by the teams. Um, persons who were incarcerated, long-term admissions, and with patients with ESRD on maintenance hemodialysis, we even had a plan for Evoshield uh, to be given, especially for them and our other immunocompromised patients. And then when we started uh, reintroducing, um, going back into the NCD clinics, we were also incorporating COVID-19 screening, and those that were positive and met the criteria for treatment, we would proceed and offer them treatment. And all of this really helped a lot in terms of identifying those at risk and making sure that they don't progress into uh, severe disease that would require hospitalization or things like that. So we did a lot of those work as a, in the outpatient. And then at the same time, we had a lot of work ongoing with um, the behavioral health team. They were continuing with healthcare worker support by performing, um, by conducting CISDs. And then for the doctors, we also initiated a special surveillance group on the WhatsApp group. So every day we would message each other and make sure that everybody was okay. So key lessons. Um, oh, sorry. The, um, extra slide. So I think the key lesson, um, next slide. Mm -mm was vaccinate and boost uh, the most vulnerable, the elderly, homebound, incarcerated, long-term hospitalized patients. Prepare for a large surge, especially because they were coming in with mild uh, illnesses. And uh, you know the importance of establishing outpatient testing and therapeutic administration sites. Uh, encouraging home isolation, because this really helped a lot with reducing bed burden in the hospital. And then uh, shifting initially when we were doing contact tracing, shifted instead to triaging, monitoring of positive high-risk patients at home. Okay, and then uh, key lessons also included, um, you know, how do we ready ourselves? Uh, getting ready for large COVID, um, like um, uh, large COVID wards, 
uh, that can manage multiple conditions. Because at one point, we were seeing all the COVID-19 positive cases with other conditions such as cellulitis and those that required wounds with sepsis, everything. So how do we manage? How do we separate them safely so we prevent further spread of other illness and infections within the hospital? And this is where we highlighted that infection prevention and control was key. And then uh, we also learned that it was okay to provide sotropimab, Paxlovid, um, other um, treatment uh, modality, uh, like the treatment recommended for patients even though they had mild COVID-19 infection. Because the purpose was to make, uh, make sure that they don't progress into severe disease. Okay, so I think before I end uh, the, our talk, I just wanted to really highlight and uh, give a lot of acknowledgement and thanks, especially to everybody who supported us during this time. So, you know, the leadership, the community, the members of the EOC, our incident commander reader who was always there to answer our questions, my bosses, <laughs> uh, Palau, uh, you know, the, our hospital preparedness program, uh, airport immigration team, they work so hard. The police, the firefighters, and the EMTs, the Palau's Health Coalition, the behavioral health team, and our international partners. Eh? We had so many people who were really helping us. And you know, we were just very grateful and humbled to have, especially the community support. Because as a healthcare provider, like during this time, we, we received a lot of messages saying, hey, doctor, make sure you drink enough water. Make sure you. <laughs> Um, eat and you know those it I think working together definitely anything that comes um, that we're faced with you know we can overcome it and then lastly one thing that I really really uh, felt that was a with all our with everyone coming on the island to help was a lot of the trainings and the teachings because when we came out of this we had a lot of new protocols new skills we now have capabilities to do high flow nasal cannula which we didn't have before so i think from you know coming in and teaching and you know it created a lot of sustainable sort of things that we're we're doing at the moment so again thank you all that's it thank you doctors uh, my refer uh, fraser and dr Dorong for your presentations Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes day one of our health summit. We want to take this opportunity to thank again all our guest speakers um, and presenters. We want to especially thank you for attending day one, and we hope to see you tomorrow. Uh, just a reminder, registration and breakfast is from 7.15 a.m. to 8.15 a.m., and the program starts at 8.15 a.m. We hope you had a great well, first day of the summit, and we hope to see you again tomorrow. Just one last reminder, please feel, uh, complete uh, the evaluation forms and submit, it, submit them at the registration table. Again, the online uh, evaluation form will be up and ready uh, by late Wednesday afternoon. Thank you once again, everybody. Have a good evening. <laughs>